go ahead and get started, and, and uh, um, I'm going to uh, let Jesper introduce our illustrious panel, Nick, Mia, and Greg, but um, I just wanted to say a few words before we began. Um, the, the serious scholarly study of video games is still a very young field, and uh, within that field, there are very few people who have contributed as much and whose, whose work and thinking are as highly esteemed as, uh, as Jesper Ewell. Um, so we are extremely proud and uh, excited to have him as a visiting arts professor at the Game Center. Um, and uh, we're here to celebrate the, uh, the launch of his new book, A Casual Revolution, as featured in the Wall Street Journal yesterday. And uh, it's especially relevant, I think, to, to, the, to the work that we're doing at the Game Center um, because one of the things that, that we want to do here uh, is uh, support and, and encourage and nurture uh, the New York City uh, game development community. And uh, I think a lot of what uh, New York City game development uh, is about and, and, and one of the main ways in which this city contributes to the culture of games is kind of thinking outside of the mainstream of just AAA console development, although we, do, we also have some, some of that going on here in, in New York City, um, uh, chaos studio guys and stuff like that. But, um, but I think we also have a, a lot to contribute uh, in some of these uh, new and uh, broader uh, audience uh, 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 kinds of uh, contexts for, for, for video games, uh, social games and, and mobile games, casual downloadable games, and and um, kind of experimenting outside of the, the, the kind of narrow genres and, and very uh, mainstream conventions of, of a lot of traditional video games. So it's, uh, it's super exciting to me, uh, and um, I'm excited to hear this panel. Uh, as, as always, the, the Game Center Lecture Series is made possible by generous grants from the Rockefeller uh, Foundation and the Cultural Innovation Grant. Um, and Sharon Chang and the TTSL Charitable Foundation and uh, other generous uh, anonymous donors. So uh, thanks for coming, and uh, I'm going to hand it over to oh, Jesper. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so well, well, thanks a lot for coming to the event. Am I coming through clearly? I guess I am. Uh, so and thanks, Frank. And so obviously, it, it's great to be here at the Game Center and, and get the chance to present something here. So. Uh, what I'll be talking today about today is, is the contents of this book, so I won't read every single page, but I'll give you a sort of a, 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 a brief outline of the overall argument. And uh, the sort of core subject here really is casual games, and casual games is understood here in a broad sense, so it, it means all, the kind, all these recent games that reach beyond the traditional video game audience, so that means like small puzzle games, Wii games, uh, down to music games like Guitar Hero, Rock Band, etc. And so the way we'll be doing it is that uh, first I'll be doing a, a 30 minute presentation of the book and then I'll have, we'll have, be having a, a sort of 45 minute uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'll actually, yeah, so just so you know what the frame is. And the panel is consists of, I'll, I'll be just to give you a brief introduction, is Mia Consalvo sits right here as she works at Comparative Media Studies at at MIT, and she's uh, the author of the book Cheating, about uh, well, cheating in video games. And she's uh, the co-editor of the forthcoming Handbook of Internet Studies. And Greg Trifry is the co-founder of Gigantic Mechanic. And before coming to uh, uh, making Gigantic Mechanic, he was a senior game designer at, at Game Lab, where he worked on games such as JoJo's Fashion Show and, and GameStar Mechanic. And I think we'll return, be returning to JoJo's Fashion Show. And he also is the director of the Come Out and Play Festival. Uh, Nick Fortuno is a game designer and founder of, uh, founder of Playmatics, also a game development company in New York City. And before being there, he was a director of, of game design at, at Game Lab, where he worked on games like Dynadash and uh, AED Cost, The Cost of Life. And now he teaches at Parsons School of Design, and he's also been working with the Come Out, of, Come Out and Play Festival. So. What I'm going to talk about today is, is what I think is a kind of a turning point in, in video game history. So 
so if you read, for those of you who read my first book, you know that that's, that that's an attempt at doing this kind of atemporal, big uh, bird's eye view of, of, of video games. And so this book is really an attempt at, at looking at, at, at recent events and at looking at so how things have changed over time, especially within the last five, ten years. And so I'm going, going to talk about games that on the whole are new, but I think one of the reasons for looking at new design is that it makes things obvious that perhaps weren't entirely obvious. So one thing you might be able to say about the sort of entire first decade of the 21st century is that it was a decade where sort of video game studies became an academic field to, to the extent that it's a field now that, that universities started to have sort of game programs. And during that period of time, and we, we got uh, video game, uh, academic video game journals. And so during that period of time, we spent a lot, lot of time sort of framing video games, uh, video games as an art form that needed to be taken seriously. And then when we did that, we, we sort of ended up uh, making a kind of canon of certain kinds of games. So we, we ended up looking at, so, so Shadow of the Colossus springs to mind, and, and well, World of Warcraft 2, like the various Legend of Zeldas, the Grand Theft Autos of the world. And so we spent that time sort of trying to make video games into something respectable, but then within that we made our own sort of little taste hierarchy. So these were like the important games, and then there were these other sort of not so important games that we might be playing in the break, so we might not really be sort of writing about. And so uh, when you look at it now, the, the sort of more recent stats say, says that we're actually at the point where more than 50% of the population plays, plays video games. So video games have actually become the norm. But video games have become the norm not because people are playing Shadow of the Colossus, right, but, be, but because people are playing sort of little games on their cell phones and in browsers and so on. And so, so I think one of the reasons to think about this, and, and to me that's a, that's a kind of personal story to this, and I think a lot of people can relate, is that I find as I grow older, I still want to finish Dragon Age, and at, at the same time as, I, as, I, as, as I'm finishing yeah, just Uncharted 2 and, and like be, keep going better at Modern Warfare 2 and etc. But it, it's sort of becoming somewhat impractical. So uh, I, I do think as a, as a kind of as a full-time academic, I, I find it sort of harder to find that time for, to, for playing that 40-hour game. And I still love the big games, but it's just that these kind of smaller casual games just fit into my life much better than the, the sort of older games did. And so uh, in the book, I've interviewed a lot of players who have similar problems. And then I think you might expect then that the video game industry had spent a lot of time trying to make sure that they'd made games that would fit into people's lives. But actually, I think the first at least 25 or 30 years of the video game industry was trying to spend trying to solve an entirely different problem, the problem of how, how to create the best graphics possible. And so... So, the f so sort of since the beginning of sort of home consoles, every, every new console was really uh, promoted on that idea of better graphics than the previous iteration. And so that goes back to say like the Nintendo 64, it was promised that they would sort of get graphics like Jurassic Park. And PlayStation 2 was, was promised that it would be like entering a movie in real time. And, and so I was going to this uh, 2005 Game Developers Conference in San Francisco and then so everything looked like it would continue with that new generation. So here's Jay Allard from Microsoft, and he talked about all these features that the, that the Xbox 360 would have, so it could, would connect you to friends and all these kind of things, but still he, he chose the idea of, the, he called it the HD era. So you could do all kinds of new things with the Xbox 360, but the thing he emphasized was really high definition graphics above all. And so Sony was sort of happy to, to follow suit with the description of the PlayStation 3. So, so they say, uh, here gamers will literally be able to dive into the realistic world seen in large screen movies <laughs> and experience the excitement in real time. Yeah, you know, it it's literally gets that sort of thing sometimes. So, yeah, well. That means through the storyline. Yeah. And so, and so I think even at, at that point, like 2005, it seems that, seemed that t things would continue the way they had always been going. Now, now we'd be, just be getting another console and even more expensive games. And at that time, Nintendo was this kind of also ran a kind of struggling video game company, and people were worrying that they might even stop producing hardware altogether. And of course, then, actually what happened was something entirely different, right? That suddenly what happened was that during that, between like 2005 and 2006, I was also staying here, and... Everybody was telling me that same story of how they'd uh, sort of 
bought a Wii, they'd taken it home to their friends and family who they've been always been trying to convince to play video games and sort of mostly unsuccessfully, and suddenly it worked, right? Suddenly these people w would actually play the games without being sort of forced to, and they would actually sort of ask to play again, and, and so on. And suddenly, so suddenly there was this kind of barrier to, that had been against video games for all that period of time and suddenly seemed to be gone, right? And then at the same time, that year was, I think, one of the first years that the office parties actually included uh, video games in a not that geeky way anymore, right? That you'd be suddenly be playing like Guitar Hero and, and things like that at, at, at an office party. So suddenly that sort of, the like, video games had entered that social space again. And also when you, when I talked to people at that time, it also turned out that suddenly a lot of people actually had like downloaded small games that they were playing on their, on their hard drives, like little puzzle games, like games about running restaurants like Dino Dash. And, and sort of cell phone games hadn't quite taken off, but people were starting to play games in browsers. So what happened was really something entirely different, right? So the Nintendo Wii sold much better than the other consoles. Right now it's at 56, point, 56 million copies sold, and the 360 is at 34 million, and the PS3 is at 28 million. <laughs> so suddenly something entirely different happened. So you can say in a way like... Up to that point of time in 2005, we sort of knew what the future would be. It would just be, we'd get another iteration of consoles, they, they, they would have better, better graphics. And what we just have, what's just sort of has happened since is that basically the future isn't really what we expected it to be. And I think one way of, of seeing it like this is that, that I think roughly from that period of time, like 1980 to, to 2005, there was a kind of standard model of video games, right? And that had th entailed three different things. You only sold games in boxes. You had a primary target audience of young males. And so everybody knew that it wasn't just young males playing video games, but still it sort of kept being kind of sort of regurgitated as an idea of who were playing video games. And as an industry, and I'll show you some examples of that, it was probably easier to sort of think of the potential audience that way. And then finally, of course, then uh, games continued to be promoted on better graphics. And that sort of created a certain kind of game. So because you're selling it in it has to have better graphics, it's sold in a box, etc. It's only sold at certain retailers, and then you end up at kind of standard kind of uh, budget, perhaps this in the area of, say, $15 million today, it might be the case. So uh, what happened now that this doesn't work anymore, or that the future isn't exactly what we thought it would be? So one way of looking at it is that I think the standard history of, of video games was that, that there was this idea that video games started out as two-dimensional, and then sometimes during the 1990s they became three-dimensional. And so what we so here's an illustration here. You can you can think about it this way that actually video games involve three kinds of space, right? That's there's a flat space of the screen, there's a 3D space if it's a three-dimensional game, and then there's a the player space, the physical space in front of the screen where the player is. And so I think what we th what it seemed to, to happen was that video games were starting in 2D and becoming 3D. But now we're seeing actually a kind of return. So a lot of these games are actually two-dimensional again, a lot of these very popular games. And then you have many games, so in this case Dance Dance Revolution, where a lot of what's interesting is actually going on in front of the screen, a lot of the spectacle of the game. So you can see that uh, perhaps like we started 2D, we move into 3D, and now we're having a sort of moment where a lot of games are actually moving back to 2D and moving into this kind of physical space in front of the screen. So that's the question of space. Uh, in terms of time, there was this, uh, the, I'll be talking about uh, casual and hardcore players, and so I'll be, but I'll be talking about them as stereotypes, because uh, as I was sure, I don't think, players generally don't actually match those categories, but they're pretty, still pretty important categories for us. So here's a, a quote from a, a 1990s uh, sort of hardcore gamer uh, journal where they, 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 make, they make fun of their own sort of like ethics about what it means to be a, a game player. So, uh, yeah, as soon as you, come, as you come home from school, immediately turn off your computer. Don't answer the phone. Go, don't go to the bathroom. You could have done that at work. Newbies should play at least until midnight. Advanced gamers need not sleep at all. At, we at weekends, gamers should stay at the monitors nonstop. So that's this kind of, you know, this, th that's the kind of stereotype of the hardcore gamer, like someone who will sort of forsake everything else in order to be able to play the game. And will obviously also play, spend an incredible amounts of time playing the game. So compared to this, then I think what sort of happened then slowly during the late 90s and during the beginning of the 2000s, you started having this idea of, of something else, which was a, a casual player, which was something which was the complete, complete opposite of the hardcore player. 
And here's um, so Scott Kim in 1998 talked about casual players playing <coughs> for short-term rewards. And here's another quote talking about that casual games were made for people who just like take a break and, and play for a few minutes. So, so the casual player here is, is described as something who's the complete opposite of a, a hardcore player. And, and here's a way I think uh, you can sort of illustrate it, that the idea of the, the hardcore player is typically someone who likes negative fiction. And by negative fiction, I mean, um, you can say, look at it like, like this. A lot of sort of traditional games are, are based, take place in settings where you don't actually want to go, right? So, so it's like, it's very exciting to, to, to be in a war in a game, but it's probably not that exciting in, in, in actuality, right? And you can say that actually in some level, a lot of the games you call casual today are actually based on the opposite. So they're based on things, places where you might actually want to go. Like you might want to go to the beach and, and play say, table tennis with your friends, for example. You might want to run a restaurant, quit your job and run a restaurant. So uh, comparative, at the same time, say like game knowledge, the, the, the assumption is that the, the hardcore player is someone that sort of knows everything about all games ever made. And the casual player is someone who doesn't know anything about any games, basically. He doesn't have any knowledge of game conventions. The hardcore player is one that like, does, will <coughs> invest any amount of time. The casual player is one that will only invest like, a few minutes every now and then. And the, the, the stereotype is also that the casual player really likes difficult games, but that the, casual play, the hardcore player really likes difficult games, but the casual player dislikes difficult games. So there was actually a quote by uh, what's your name, Kapalka from PopCap saying, that a casual game, no casual game has ever failed but for being too easy. He sort of, he later, he later retracted that. So, so by, <laughs> but, but still, that, that was an idea at a period of time that that was what you needed to do to make a, a game that reached this audience. So in the book, what I did was I, I interviewed a lot of players on the Game Cebo website, which let me uh, run an online survey and do some television interviews with different people. And so this is a, a female player of downloadable casual games who lives in a, on a farm in Arkansas, and she's retired. And so basically she says that, that every morning she will get up and feed her she sheep and her pigs, and then she'll play like five or six hours uh, of, of, of downloadable casual games every day. So, so obviously that, that's, I think we've also probably seen that headline that like casual players play in hardcore ways, so, so which is has often been that continued story that you have the stereotype of the casual player, and then when you interview at least, say, like self-selecting dedicated players, they will actually report playing like very, in, in, very intensely and, and spending a lot of time on this. And so also the, the survey I did on the game CB website said that at least one out of seven uh, plays at least 30 hours a week. So, so it's not uncommon among this, like most dedicated players of these so-called casual games. So. This raised the question, right, in, in some way, like, do, does, does it even exist? Like, is there something called casual? And in, in this case, say, if casual games can be played in non-casual ways, where can we actually locate it? So one theory might be that, uh, which I reject, one theory might be that, that uh, a you can play a game casually or hardcore or intensely, however way you want it. I, I'm going to say that it's a little more complicated than that. But... Um, you can see that it's actually sort of two ways of, of locating the casual. So historically, like the first references I could find to that idea was a, 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 a 1936 article on discussing bridge. It talked about the idea of playing a casual game of bridge. So in this case, the, the casualness was not something, it's not, it's not a property of the game, it's a property of the player and attitudes towards the game. And conversely, um, the earliest references I can find to that you have a game being casual, like the casual being a property of the game, I, I find it from like 1990. So, well, so what's the answer? Well, here's the answer. Well, it's a little more complicated, obviously. So, so this takes it into a, a sort of short discussion of, of the state of video game studies. So, a lot of the early history of video game studies, we had this idea we discussed like the, the question of stories in games, and it's called like ludology versus narratology, and and everybody, a lot of people were really excited about that discussion and then got, got somewhat tired of it afterwards, right? But, but still, it turned out that was actually a pretty easy discussion because we agreed on the terms of the discussion. We agreed that there was something called a game and it had a certain form and you can, could discuss that form and reach a meaningful conclusion about that form. And so, so that discussion of stories was actually pretty interesting. So what we have now, I think, in, in, in video game studies is 
a kind of sort of ongoing discussion about what is the actual object of studies. And I think it's to some extent even divided into two journals. So generally speaking, the game studies journal at least comes from a tradition of, of taking games as aesthetic objects that you can analyze. And to some extent, the games and culture journal comes from a tradition of, of looking at like players and the social context around, around a game. And so the problem really is that we, we sort of, I think we are at this kind of point where we are, we are battling out between those two positions. So, um, and both, of course, have problems. So if you're only looking at the games, you, you're not really, you can't really tell the difference between players. You can't explain why, why players like different games. And if you're only looking at players, you can't really tell the difference between, between different games. And you can't really explain why a specific player might like one game but not, not another game. And it's not that any researcher is going to tell you that they only care about players or they only care about games, but it's just that I think that at least by training, and I, I, I come from the left side by, by training, uh, you probably have a preference for certain kinds of conclusions. So the meta argument in the book is that we need to sort of try to get beyond that, and we, if video game studies are to progress, we need to start talking about how games and players interact without trying to sort of root for one side or the other from the beginning. And so what I did in this book was, was to combine things. Right? I tried sort of playing a lot of games and I talked to a lot of players and I tried to ask that question, what is the relation between the game design and the players and how the, player, the game is played? So I showed that you this idea of the hardcore player so some of the people I, I interviewed, they, they showed what you, some people call a lapsed hardcore player behavior, which I, to which I also place myself to some extent. That, say, here's a 30-year-old player talks about he, used to, he really loves epic games, but it's just more time than he can provide. Now he has like more obligations. And so he tries to play a game, but he's interrupted by various things. Uh, here's another uh, a female player talks about she, she used to play World of Warcraft, but now she has a baby, and that actually prevents her from playing the game. And now she's sort of, well, she was recruited on the Game Zebra website, so presumably she's playing sort of more sort of downloadable casual games. So it means that if you, if you want to continue in this way of sort of illustrating it, it's, a, it's actually a lot more sort of complicated than this. So, so the casual players are interviewed, they still, most of them still pref express they like somewhat cheery. Uh, settings, but obviously within the games they were playing, they were, had like lots of knowledge. So these people have, have like complete, expansive knowledge about all these kind of downloadable casual games. A lot of them put very high investment. A lot of them actually really prefer difficult games, saying that otherwise they're not getting their money's worth. Right? It needs to be a challenge. And conversely, you can see the ex-hardcore players I, I just mentioned here. Well, they probably still like dark fictions, but because they're playing less, they're getting out of touch with like the current state of game convention, so they're sort of moving, sliding in that direction. They're using less and less time, and also to some extent because they, they want to get somewhere in the game when they're playing it, they're also getting a, gravitating to a somewhat easier game where you have a guarantee that you're getting somewhere if you're playing for just 15 minutes. So, well, how does that player interact with the game design? So where is that casual? And so, let me switch a little to talking about the, the game design f as, as such for a period of time. And I think you might say it's actually easiest to think about in negative terms that given that video games are so great, right? We, I think most people here, it's, it's like that you, you, people are here like video games to some extent, right? Given that video games are so great, how come there's all these people who haven't been playing them? So that's the question. Right? So you can frame it in negative terms. And I think certainly, I think a lot of it's, it's fair to say that a game like the cover of a game like StarCraft, so the very first thing you see if you look at the game in a store on a website, the cover of this game StarCraft with this brooding alien face, realistically actually scares away a lot of people. And, and the quote from, and the quote for, from this uh, publisher Oberon says, yeah, well, remember over half of this audience, audience is women, over 80% are over 30. As realistic as the blood effects are in your vampire corpse feast game, it isn't going to sell to a casual audience. So again, it's also a, a kind of rejection of sort of traditional sort of hardcore gamer values. So yeah, so I mean, one could be tempted to say that that really like the sun always shines in casual games. So so, and, and we'll also be returning to that. At least there's been a sort of tendency for for games aimed at a broad audience to be sort of very cheerful and very sort of cheery. We did discuss whether that's actually technically necessary, but but certainly I think that's been the case. So. 
what happens afterwards? Assuming we haven't scared away the player with this sort of alien brooding face or something, then what happens next? Well, can he or she actually pick up the game and, and try to learn to play it? So one of the case studies in, in the book concerns uh, the history of matching tile games, going from sort of very early games like, like Tetris and via Yoshi's Cookie, if you can tell, and a game called Sumer, and down to a game like Puzzle Quest. And uh, what I'm showing is, what it turns out is that games tend to develop very gradually, and I think it's very, you can very easily see how games build in other games, add new conventions, uh, build in other games yet again. And you can also see that when players pick up a game, you can see it in game reviews and in bulletin board posts, they tend to compare a game to the previous games they've played, right? So, which means if you played a lot of games, it's easy to sort of understand a new game you've picked up. And if you, but if you haven't played a lot of games, there might be all kinds of conventions and signals that you don't really understand. So. If you haven't been following video game history, there's actually a lot of new games that are very intimidating and some, sometimes inc incomprehensible. One way of saying it is actually that when video games develop a new creative language, which is great, they also shut out a lot of players who didn't know that language. And that's the kind of, perhaps like the kind of paradox or a problem we, we are sort of dealing with now. And then I think what's sort of happened during the last five, 10 years is that we've, people have figured out ways of dealing with that. So, so, of course, the, the simplest way is, is simply having something that the player already knows. So when, when, when Solitaire originally became a, a Windows uh, application, I think it was like around 1990, it was immediately playable by, by people because most of the people at the time actually knew Solitaire, Solitaire the card game. So, of course, they could pick that up. Uh, affordance for familiarity is, is what, we, what you might say, like the, the Wii strategy or the, or, the, or, the rock band or the music game strategy, which is to give people an object that they know what to do with. So it doesn't matter if you haven't played guitar, right? But everybody has an idea that a guitar involves like something with the hand here and something with the hand here. And then you have, and most of these games also have this kind of pose <laughs> sort, of, sort of involved. So, so you're, you're just you're pushing, a, you're pushing a button, right, that you can most almost the entire population understands what that entails, right? And then I think sort of finally that, that there's a, with what I, I call this mimetic interfaces, all these interfaces where you like do sort of big physical movements uh, that sort of mime the action in the game space, is that they make it easier to learn from watching others. So if you're watching someone play a strategy game or a tennis game on an Xbox 360 controller, they'll be doing all kinds of like crazy little button pushes, right? It's actually going to be very hard to figure out what that is. But if you're watching someone play Wii Tennis, at least on the sort of high level, it's easier to pass what that is. So, so that's a, you can, might say that they sort of help people make a more sort of social learning experience. So, so this was a question about where I asked people, like, what typically interrupts you when you play? Uh, and you can see this is a word cloud on, based on frequency. So you can see the phone, the phone sort of wins by far. So it comes about phone and calls and telephone and kids, and the, there's a strong sort of female, uh, uh, there's a f strong female emphasis in, in the survey, so the husband comes up, but wife doesn't, so, so go figure. <laughs> uh, yeah, cooking, responsibilities, moms, uh, actually, so uh, also work is obviously interesting uh, on, on the left, so, uh, but, but, uh, but I think that's, that we know that. So, so, so that's this kind of question where, how does, the play, how does the game actually fit into the life and into the schedule of, of the player? So there's this idea of the short session. So I think what you might say is that the, casual, the typical new casual game design allows you to play in short, short, session, but, but short sessions, but it doesn't force you. So if you want to play for two hours or, or ten hours, it's okay. But if you want to play for five, three minutes, it's also okay. And compare that to, to playing... Uh, well, actually, even like Uncharted 2, which is like a somewhat sort of friendly game, it still has this kind of problem that you don't know exactly how long you, you have to play to get somewhere. And also, well, you can pause it, but you, if you have to switch off the console, you might not ex actually be able to go get back to exactly where you were. And also that we tend to like to play in our lives, right? So I think it's a problem with a lot of traditional games is that they don't really allow you to do that. You're just starting a level and you... It's like it might be five minutes or two minutes to the save point. It might be two hours. You don't actually know, so, which means the game asks you to make an ahead of time commitment of indefinite length. You just don't know what it is. And so you can, can see like one of the reasons why something like, say like music games tend to work so well is like you understand what the length of 
whatever should I stay or should I go is. So you say, I'm, I'm going to share a place, should I stay or should I go? And you know that's like four minutes or, or whatever that is. And that, that just means that it's easier for players to sort of to plan around the game. And for a long period of time, I think that really wasn't true. So I'll be showing something else. So a lot of you probably played this game. So it's, it's, a, game called, uh, it's a game called Peggle. Uh, so Peggle is uh, by PopCap, who's sort of very famous for making games that have lots of what you might call polish, or polish, or I might, I'm going to call it juiciness here. So this is the end of a, a level, and the goal of the game is to hit all the red pegs. So I'm going to do that now. <laughs> oh! There we go. All right. So, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so, so uh, I got. So, several people have put, proposed the term uh, juiciness to to explain this. That, that's the idea of like you you touch the game and all this kind of stuff comes out. Well, basically, and all this kind of things happens in in response to it, which well, well has many different things going for it. So, Donald Norman would probably call this a visceral quality. Uh, actually, my, I had my father play this game. He doesn't actually play a lot of video games, but, but he exclaimed at the end of this level, he said, like, it feels like somebody is praising me all the time. <laughs> and, and I think that's actually that's a pretty, sort of pretty good sort of description of it. So it provides a kind of emotional support, and especially if you're not really used to playing games, it's very nice for the game to like, continually assert that you're doing the right thing. Um, and also that what, what you can also see is that yeah, and again, it's interesting from this kind of information point of view because at this point, like when you hit the last pick, you've probably figured out that you completed the level right, but the game just keeps on piling this kind of positive feedback and positive support and extra bonuses. And even though the score actually doesn't actually mean all that lot in the, all that much in the game, you just like get more and more points and points and points. So I think what you can see is that, that this kind of game design actually supports the player a lot and also talks very directly to the player. So one of, the, one of the talks we had here at the Game Center was, was Clint Hawking, who talked about uh, his game Far Cry 2 and how they spent uh, possibly millions of dollars making, a game, making the map in the game so it wasn't just like overlaid on the screen, but it was like inside the world, and it, which is very complicated because it involved all this like shuffling of game objects. And it's a, it's a great game, but it's, it's still interesting. He spent all that time sort of preserving the sort of sanctity of the 3D space and not without, because he didn't want to reference like the, the two-dimensional space of the screen and he didn't want the game to talk directly to the player. And you can see that, that a game like this certainly is, is the complete opposite, right? It's like it talks to the player and they, they will use, you know, they will, they will use words like you and, and sort of address you directly. So there's also a shift in the communication that way from like inside the 3D space to like talking directly to the player outside the game. So I think that that's a way, perhaps it's a, then way, I think the idea of, of casual and hardcore is perhaps better understood as a kind of affordance, like what does this specific design allow you to do? So you might have a game, uh, uh, well, it's like perhaps like an exaggerated traditional hardcore game which says that you can only play for, so well, actually World of Warcraft is a good example, for, at least in the time investment, right? It's, it's hard to play, it's hard to do a lot of the interesting things like guild, like guild raids and stuff without actually having doing that, so all right, now we're playing for six hours and I can't be interrupted in any way and so on. And that's actually a, a problem for a lot of people. So you can see, I think one way of expressing that is then is that the casual game designs I've looked at here, they don't sort of prevent you, they allow you to play for very short periods of time, like at the very far end, but they also allow you to play, put huge amounts of energy and huge amounts of time in that game. And likewise, the fact that if you don't know the game conventions, it's hard to under play a sort of real-time strategy game. But the fact that you know a lot of game conventions doesn't prevent you from playing a very sort of accessible, simple, casual game. So I think that sort of explains to some extent why these things we call casual games reach a, reach a broader audience, because they allow more different, they allow the player to sort of select the ways in which they want to play the game, and they, can re they don't prevent people from playing the game the same way as sort of traditional core game does. And I think that perhaps that that's, you might, some people might think that's disappointing, right? But, but I think the truth of the matter is that, that all of these like amazing like 30-hour experiences just have prevented a lot of people from playing games. 
So, so I think that's that's perhaps like the the, the really is is a core argument that perhaps game, casual game design is not about casualness necessarily, but about flexibility. So it's about a game that sort of fits into people's lives that can be used by different people in different contexts in different ways. So whereas so it's also about the game designer taking that other step of abdication of control and say and not having to just wanting to decide exactly when the, the people are going to play exactly for how long and letting that actually be up to the player to decide for themselves. So 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 the interesting thing then is I said like casual game design doesn't really exist or casual players don't necessarily exist the way we imagine they would exist. But I think they they play a very important role in, in the game industry now. So here's a quote from, from Margaret Wallace, who made some worked on these games like dogs and dogs and cats, these pet games. And she talked about that they, they her company PF Magic got integrated into a larger company who was selling games like Panzer General and, and Warhammer. And then that that they say like they did not like us, they thought we were a joke. And she said that even then when once they had that data saying that they had more had a more balanced gender or uh, the, the, the the gender distribution of the audience was more balanced it was hard for people to sort of accept that at the time. And I think that's the weird thing with this idea of casual players is that pro probably they don't really exist in the way they've been imagined to exist, it seems. But the idea of casual players has been one that's been really important for the industry to sort of as a way of thinking about who to market for and how to design the games. So in a way, it's a, yeah, it's necessarily, it's not, it's, it's a stereotype that probably doesn't really hold water if you look at it. But it's really important. And it's also really important in, a, in, in an, another way. This is one of those slides that has too much text. But I just wanted to, this was a, a woman around 30 I interviewed. So what games do you play? And it's like Wii, Xbox, Elder Scroll, Morrowind, Oblivion, Star Wars, Knights of the Old Republic, looking forward, Perfect Dark, looking forward to Thief. And then it's like, she says, I'm a casual console gamer. I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and then, so, so the question, like, what, what does that actually mean? Why would she say that? And then she says, well, it's because, she plays for leisure. She just promotes a tremendous. She just devoted a tremendous amount of time to playing, and she know, knew people who would skip, miss sleeping, who would skip classes, etc. So here, casual signifies someone who has a life and who has friends, right? So, <laughs> so, so the idea of the casual player is also something that allows you to identify someone who plays video games, but in a sort of positive way, evading that traditional hardcore player, hardcore gamer stereotype. Again, even though casual players don't necessarily exist in that way, even though she's not really a casual player by sort of, sort of traditional standards, it's important for her to have that way of talking about herself. Um, yeah, so why casual games now? I think I will sort of be sigging into the, the panel now. But uh, so this was like a projection that, so console generations had been doubling. Yeah, so there's a mistake in the PS8. But, Every console generation, uh, and then you could do this projection. Uh, I think that around 2036, uh, a, a game would have to cost like one billion dollars to make, and, <laughs> and around 2060, I think a, a game would have to sell one billion copies to reach break even. And then, yeah, and then 2090 or something, uh, there would be every person on earth would have to buy more than one copy. To, to <laughs> so, 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 so obviously, you can see that that can't possibly continue the way it did, right? And, and I think what we're seeing now is that sort of breaking point. Um, and there's a lot, there's a lot more, more to it than that. Um, so then, I mean, so I think that during the 25, first 25 years of video game history, the industry just kept promoting games and consoles and better graphics. And in this book, I really argue that the main barrier really hasn't been a lack of quality game graphics, but the fact that Games require time commitments, or they require a knowledge of game history that people didn't have or weren't really willing to give, and that's really like what casual game is, casual games are about. And it also means that uh, if you talk about video game studies, it's also important to sort of get beyond that games over players kind of uh, dis discussion and to think about like how do those two things actually interact? How do the sort of what the players want and the players' life? How do, how do these things actually interact with the concrete game design? And so. I guess you can say, past then, what, what's sort of really happening isn't that, I think, isn't that video games have become cool, but that video games have become sort of a normal, right? Because everybody actually plays games, right? And uh, just there was this period of time where we, we thought like there was something magical about video games that meant they could only be for this kind of small por portion of the population. And I think what's happening is that, so it's become clear that's not the case anymore. 
yeah, thank you. And that was my, my talk. <laughs> yeah. And so, and so, so I'll, I'll pull up my, my esteemed panel. So, yeah. Is that okay? Sure. That's mine. Oh. And uh, now we actually, and so this is Mia Consalvo, and this is Nick Fortunu, and this is Greg Trufry. And thanks for coming. And so, so uh, I sent out some, some questions in, in, in advance. And, and actually, going to be show, now we're getting that problem that it, the, the, there's going to be a slide behind you, but it's, I think we should be fine. So, so here's actually the first question uh, I wanted to, to sort of ask, ask you. So, so as I said, it, it seems there's a tendency that, that a lot of these games we call, call sort of casual, they, that they've actually been yeah, very bright and, and cheery. And so, on some level, it seems that it sort of helps video games escape the kind of cultural ghetto that it was part of. On the other hand, do we risk that it makes video games sort of too safe? Because it, it just seems that like people are, people who see, watch CSI, right? So it's not that the general public is completely like scared about anything that's sort of not cheery. So 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 uh, do you like any? So what, what do you think about that? Is is that do we risk sort of video games becoming a, a sort of cheery? Positive, acceptable, non-ghetto, but by losing some of the like more serious, perhaps artsy. Um, well, I, I, I guess I have two responses to that. The first is that um, if you look at the hidden object movement that's occurred in casual downloadable games, which is really the the dominant type of game in, in a casual downloadable space right now, the narratives have moved into darker and darker territory. Like the latest uh, mystery case files has a picture of a wolf on it in like a dark, mm. misty setting, right? And they're really framed as kind of these like mystery stories in the CSI vein. Yeah. Um, and that was really, when that started to happen, that was surprising because, you know, we, we had all been taught by the portals, like, don't do this, don't do this, yeah. don't do this. But then they came out. Um, and so I think there, there is an, ex an expanded, there's a sense that the audience will, will certainly bear more than, 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 than everybody smiling and the sun shining all the time. Um, but then on the other hand, there was, you know, like uh, the, one of my favorite stories from the, from, from, from my work in casual games is that we, you know, Game Lab, we worked on this game called Plantasia, and the, the narrative in Plantasia was a romance story between a, uh, a, 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 a sort of pixie in training and this guy that she had to fulfill a wish for. And the, the story of the, of the narrative told over, you know, probably 12 pages of comics is them meeting, not liking each other, her starting to learn that he's got a dark past, realizing that he has, has a tragic love affair in his past, getting to know him, them falling in love, them admitting their love to each other, and then them kissing at the very last moment. And we, we got, the, the publisher of the gameplay first uh, wrote me to tell me that there had been complaints that, that we let two characters kiss in a game intended for children. Uh, and I was, uh, this, this fascinated me because I was like, what, how, how do you want your children to learn about kissing? <laughs> I'm like, you know, like, like having two characters fall in love over the course of a six hour arc seems like a pretty good time for them to, to kiss. So, I, I think there's a, there's a the, 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 what the audience will bear is sort of fraught the way it's fraught in all entertainment. And I think that, that, that there's, a, there's a choking that goes on at the level of distribution that, that sort of prevents this stuff. But then it, it, it has actually started to seep out um, even in the casual space. And I think it will, will only naturally continue. And, and especially when you look at social games, since, since a genre, I guess, of social games is mafia games, mm. right, that's a pretty good sign that, that, that casual will accept uh, broader kinds of narrative. But I think you, you were, you did a study of people playing, yeah, Ravenhurst, right? Yeah, Return yeah. to Ravenhurst. Yeah. yeah, I mean, the especially with hidden object games, I mean, they have lots of murders hmm. and death and ghosts and haunting and hmm. grisly. I mean, like, dire, um, the new one, the Mr. Case Files, I mean, the, the promo trailer for it looks like Blair Witch. Yeah. You know, with, like, the college students who just kind of, like, go off the road and disappear. Um, and at the same time, I mean, you still have lots of more hardcore games like Super Mario Sunshine. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, I think of, like, racing games as not being particularly dark and foreboding. No, no, no. Um, yeah. So I think it's just more a greater diversity, you know, of choices. And we are seeing a lot more just kind of opening up of different casual game genres. And, like, I see, like, especially with Game Zebo. They've been trying to get more types of games um, for casual players. They've been introducing them to like tower defense games. Oh, Braid, right? It was reviewed. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, you know, like iPhone games are now part of their regular repertoire when before it was like just kind of all hidden object and time management games all the time. 
Yeah, I mean, it seems like a, I mean, in some ways it seems like a, the, everyone thought they had to be cheerful because that was what was successful to start with, you know? It's like, and so then the market sort of rushes to that. Mm. You know, let's all emulate what, what seemed to work. Like, oh, gyms seem popular. Let's do more gyms. Um, and now it does seem like it's, it's very varied, and especially when you begin to expand the definition of casual kind of um, to include the stuff you're talking about, like Guitar Hero mm. and, and Rock Band and, um, or like Facebook games, like the, the Mafia games are werewolf stuff on there, mm. it, it becomes a, a much broader palette. Or if you look at like something like Jaya's games where, you know, they're, they're small games which would, mm. I think would be kind of casual. And there it's like a, a very wide range from abstract to, mm. um, to cheerful stuff. Isn't there dark. an iPhone game for Dexter? Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do in the game? Just I think you, you, it's like a CSI game. Mm. Oh, okay. But I haven't played it to say like how much like you are a serial killer or not. <laughs> But I think some of the examples we, you all mentioned here are, are, are I guess you can call s the sort of established, somewhat safe versions of dark content, right? So, mm. so an old style detective story is, yeah you, yeah, you talk about the latest game, which was more like Blair Witch, but still a lot of it has been this kind of old style, uh, 100, 100 years ago mystery story, right? And then like the Mafia Wars is, is it's a mafia, so it's not like sort of like, Gang wars in Los Angeles today, right? So, so, so right. There, there's something that, that that it's true. It has some somewhat dark sides, but it's still like a certain kind of sort of well-established, little in the distance. Well, I think. I mean, I, I, I guess I, I think we. I think we were saying. I think. Yeah. It, I think it's weird. I mean, I think, um, and you kind of make the point. You say it's at some point in your book that um, I think looking to casual games for like to lead the way in sort of very mm -hmm. dark narratives mm -hmm. or or really or even really innovative mechanics isn't necessarily like a good place to look, right? Mm -hmm. Like, uh, you know, casual games are aimed at a broad audience, and so you get a certain, um, you know, a certain chunk in the middle, you know, rather than uh, things on the, on the very far end, having really dark content. I don't think casual games are necessarily ever going to do that, and I don't mm -hmm. think they're really intended to. They're, they're supposed to capture a broad audience mm -hmm. commercially. I, I would just add that, I mean, games, even hardcore games at the very other end of this disturbing spectrum, something like Manhunt, mm -hmm. I mean, it... It definitely comes with controversy. It's not just automatically accepted. And when you know researchers have talked with players of those types of games, lots of them will say things like, "I feel really uncomfortable with this," or you know, like lots of people really refuse to shoot dogs in video games. You know, and um, <laughs> people are fine apparently. Yeah. <laughs> dogs are like the no no fly zone, um, but they have different relationships with games that might be considered more dark and disturbing mm. and grisly, uh, you know, and they're, they can be more hardcore players, and it's just mm. we haven't really thought about that and their relationship to the game and how they negotiate that content <coughs> for themselves. Um, but yeah, I think you're right, too. I mean, with casual games, I mean, and we haven't really talked about, that's just like violence and grisliness, but like a game with some kind of message or meaning or argument that it wants to make. Mm. Um, I'm not sure how much of that we're seeing yet. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's pokes at things like environmentalism yeah. in casual games. Um, there's acceptable messages. Yeah, yeah, acceptable. I mean, it's, it's it's family TV, right? Like that's I mean that's that's who the portal see themselves aimed right. at, and that's like, you know, like and there's and there's another, I mean it's not like that's an unusual understanding, right? Like mm -hmm. go go watch ABC Family for a little while, and you'll see kind of similar stuff. People can get murdered, but they can't get bludgeoned to death with blood and brains all over the place, right? People can do bad things to each other, but it's in the realm of acceptability, and I think that's fine. I mean, I would disagree about mechanics. Innovation and mechanics, but I feel like there's a safety in in narrative that, that 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 goes forward. But I agree with your point too. I think games generally just don't have a good i ha haven't had a really good time uh, as as being accepted culturally dealing with dark material. You know, Super Columbine Massacre comes out and it's like supposed to be an art game and it's incredibly disturbing and everybody freaks yeah. out, um, including people who accept Elephant, which is a movie about the same content um, that's considered controversial but somehow acceptable to watch. And so. So I'm not sure that casual is even a weight of casual games. I think it's just games in general have yet to mm. it's yet to be figured out exactly how they can cover uncomfortable material. Yeah, or how culture can get get around to accepting the fact that they might cover. Yeah, the yeah, there's a better way of putting it. Uncomfortable material. So, so, so one question that 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 then com comes to mind. So we talked about like say, like safe content and stuff like that. So I, I could. It's easy to find a lot of quotes where, where the more like traditional video game industry is, is criticized for, for only making games for itself, right? So, so there's this criticism like, 
that, that a specific developer shouldn't just like make whatever he typically likes, but she should also make something that sort of reaches a broader audience. And, and I thought that was very interesting because I, I, it, turned, it, reminded, it, it turned to me, it, it turned out, I thought that you could also frame it in another way, right? But, but so in the, in the book interviews, I, I interview different developers, several of, of which are, are sort of present in the room, about that that's kind of question of how do you make games for, for an audience of which you're not necessarily part. And then there's a, there's a, there's a wide variety of different responses. So, so Nick wa wa was, was the kind of, He's the kind of gamer that, that just has, a, and correct me if I'm wrong, that has like a wide range of interesting games. And, and so he likes a lot of other games, but he just also likes like small games when he's been like casual games when he's been doing that. And some other ones, again, were, were people who just said, well, again, well, they had kids and, and stuff like that. They didn't really like the very sort of like epic 40-hour games. They liked these kind of small games. So they were really in the target audience, even though they didn't necessarily have the kind of right age or gender to sort of match the idea of the target audience. And then yet again, there, there's a, a, I talked to a Garrett Link from Real Arcade. So he talked that one, said that one, in one of the studios, they had the story of, of their audience. So there was uh, two women called Marie and Sophie. And so, so whenever they were making something, they might be discussing and saying like, oh yeah, yeah, we'll do that. It's awesome, it's awesome. And then somebody will be saying, but will Marie and Sophie like it? And then they're like, no, they won't. <laughs> and then, 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 they, then, then they wouldn't make, make, make the game that way. And so, so I thought, it seemed to me that, that so it, it, this whole thing, just like with the expanding audience, it just introduces an entire new sort of relation between the developer and the target audience. And, and, and it occurred to me you could actually sort of, you could sort of frame it in this positive way, right? You could also frame it in a, in a sort of negative way. And I'm, I'm just doing this because it's, it's it, I, Here's a problem I can't really figure out how to solve. So, so here's a, an interview with uh, J.K. Rowling of Harry Potter. And the one thing she asserts is that she's not writing for a daughter or even for her children. And certainly not to make money, of course, but just like she just writes for herself. <laughs> and, so actually, and so actually, it's an interesting thing is uh, when, when, if we have the idea of, of so like the artist, that, that then if the artist makes things for, with the goal of reaching a broad audience, we call that sort of pandering or selling out. And so, so, so the question is like, do game developers have an obligation towards mm -hmm. reaching a broad audience? Question mark. <laughs> hmm. Um, you, yeah. No. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, like, I don't, I, you know, like, if, if I make um, a serious man or I make, uh, oh, what's a, what's a good contemporary horror movie? I can't think of one off the top of my head. I make The Ring. Like, I'm not intending not to go to everybody. I, I don't make art. You don't ever make, you don't even design for everybody. What does designing for everybody actually mean? Um, I, I think that you design for somebody um, when, you're, when you have a marketplace. I, I, I don't generally believe people who say that they just make something they think is cool and they don't ever think about the, a marketplace when they're selling it. That just seems crazy. Um, but, but that's not to say that I'm, you know, like that, that, that should be limited. I mean, Modern Warfare 2, 2 sold a lot of copies, tons and tons and tons of copies, very commercially successful. Um, there's a type of player who bought that game, and that is the only type of player who bought that game. I feel fair, I haven't studied it, but I, I just feel fairly confident knowing the history of these things. If I'm wrong, you have research that tells me I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. But, but like, and there's nothing wrong with that, right? Like, there's people who want to play the next Call of Duty game, and we should make games for the next Call of Duty. I think it's not an obligation, it's, it's a missed opportunity from an entrepreneurial perspective, right? There's a huge population of 70 year olds looking for games to play, and they're not going to play Modern Warfare 2. It's a very silly industry that doesn't like, try to figure out what kind of games they want and, and make those games. And I don't think that's necessarily, that's not pandering. I mean, you know, like you're trying to make something that people enjoy. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't see mm -hmm. how that's a bad thing to do. Yeah, I mean, I, I would think like, I mean, it, yeah, it kind of boils down to either economics or, uh, you know, or your sort of whatever personal intent you have. And J.K. Rowling, you know, she's got enough money that she doesn't have to write for anybody but herself anymore, you know. Um, uh, and, and if you're, you know, but if you want to reach a certain audience, I think you do have to keep in mind, you know, who that is. Like, so, yeah, like, either if it's Call of Duty, they, they made that game for those people. It's tuned specifically for them. There are not a lot of people stumbling upon it, being like, oh, cool. Um, this seems like it's, uh, you know, maybe a couple of people who, you know, heard about it in the news or something. But um, I think, in general, like, you... You're always, you know, when you're designing games, you're kind of always thinking about the player, and you kind of have to, um, you know, you have to keep them in mind, right? Because there, someone else is going to engage with it and play with it, you know. And, and I think it's very easy to sort of sometimes, um, you know, kind of get very within yourself, um, you know, when you're making anything. But I think games in general force you to always think about who's going to pick it up, 
in a different way than a book does necessarily or a movie. I think there are a couple different things being conflated here. I mean, I can see for you know particular designer and maybe especially more with indie games, somebody saying, "I want to make this game, this particular game that I have either a statement or an you know, art style or something that I want to express in this way, and you know it is an expression of my whatever hmm. that is going into this game." Um, which I don't think necessarily had happens with like Madden <laughs> or um, you know Final Fantasy games or, or that kind of thing. I mean, it, these are games. It's like the large Hollywood epic. You know, it's hard to say that there's somebody's vision being played out, that somebody's making it for themselves. You know, they're making it for a wider audience. But I think where some of the critique comes from there is, um, you know, early critique of like games being made like for me, you know, people saying, well, you can't just make games for you. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessarily that it was, you know, like you personally as a developer, maybe, um, but you as a a representative of a particular demographic. Because going back to those original stereotypes of the young male yeah. game player, it was also the young male who was the developer, and it was sort of seen as a self-reinforcing cycle. You know, you make yeah. games that are appealing to you as a particular demographic yeah. group, who's going to enjoy that game the most? People of yeah. your demographic group. So the argument was, maybe if you make games for people outside of that, you know, and then it gets more challenging. How do you conceptualize that without resorting to another gross stereotype mm. of Marie and Sophie? Yeah. <laughs> and, right. You know, whatever it is they're interested in as being like maybe the polar opposite of you. Um, but, you know, I can see where that argument came from. Mm. And um, now it seems like we've kind of moved past it and we're seeing a broader spectrum of those types of games, you know, for other groups, for broad, you know, like the Spider-Man games yeah. and then like the indie games. <coughs> I mean, I like I like designing games with like some you know some other person in mind. I think it's very helpful, you know, and so you know it, it gives you you know something to shoot for. You know, you can go talk to those people if you can find them, you know, and, yeah. and it gives you a way to you know to kind of constrain the game, or it gives you it helps you figure out like sort of um, you know how long things should take and what it should look like and that sort of thing. So I think mm -hmm. it's it's a very useful thing when you're designing. Yeah, I mean, I approach that from from the abstract direction of like, well, if, if, if audience X likes this content, I try to dissect this content and figure out, well, what about, like I have several examples of it, like what about this content is, is similar that right. seems to draw this audience to it, and then you just make things with those, mm -hmm. with those pieces, and you don't really, I mean, it's a very, it's much more abstract way to do it, but you don't need a picture. I, I, I never in game design like went to my mom, and I, and I know that like people at PopCap did this. They would, they, they would take their mother into the, the mm -hmm. studio and she would be a litmus test on their games. And I think that's a really acceptable way to do it, but I don't think that's the only way to do it. You can just look at the content that exists and sort of imagine what another form of this content would be preserving some of the essentialities of it. And so right. I think there's a lot of ways to skin that cap, but I, I think it's, it, it, I don't know, I just, I, I think it's, if you're, t what you're talking about is the design discipline, I think you need to be thinking about your audience. Like that's what it means to be designing in the first place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how do you approach playtesting then? Is that, I mean, are you looking at mechanics? Are you looking at ideas for broadly changing games? I mean, are you looking for specific things? And, you know, are there things that you just won't consider um, changing, even if, you know, people say because that you feel like that's tied to your design or your intent or? I think, well, I mean, I suppose it depends on the purpose of the work. Let's say it's yeah. not, it's not like an indie game. I'm not going to make, uh, like, Today I Die, right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make something that I, I'm, I'm really intending to sell. In, in, in some form. In that case, yeah, you, you bring in members of the audience to, to review it, but I think it's, there's, there's, it's just part of the game design process that you, you have prototypes that you cannot show to your audience. And you have to make decisions in that early stage about like, well, is this an acceptable thing for that audience? And you need a capacity to do that yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, that, so the first step is, a, is a sort of establishing for yourself some kind of parameters, which might be a vision of a person, mm -hmm. or it might be an abstract sort of design set of parameters where you say, okay, this is my litmus, that this thing is acceptable and I'm going to judge it against that litmus. And then the testing is, is, is as much a testing of your understanding of the audience as it is of the inst instantiation of the thing you've made. Because if the audience comes back and says, no, I, I really want this level to take two hours, then you have to, like, you know, you have to change your, your, your understanding of who that audience is. Yeah, I mean, often, I mean, and, and plate testing is always hard because, I mean, it's, you know, there's a certain art to sort of figuring out what, what, Feedback to take, you know, what's uh, you know, there, people often have suggestions which are like, well, yeah, but that's probably not a really good idea, um, and uh, um, until you hear it a bunch of times, and then some, then, then you have to think, well, maybe if everyone's kind of asking for it, maybe I should reconsider it, you know, um, or put it in there, uh, and you know, and if it works with the intent, but also, you know, when you're doing playtesting, also, 
you know, you're, it's a small sample, and it's a, probably a like a self-selecting sample that will come in and play right. test a game for you, you know, or your mom who mm -hmm. will probably always yeah. kind of like what yeah. you do. So, but then at the same time, like, just I'm gonna butt in because going back to the rolling example, and you know, there's a spoiler. If you haven't read the books yet, I'm sorry, but I mean, like, if she had brought in people and said, you know, read this book, That's true. and you know, what happened to Dumbledore? How do you feel about that? Yeah. You know, how many people would have been like, I didn't like that. Yeah. But, but I mean, it does happen in the in the film industry sometimes, right? Well, wasn't yeah. like Rocky, whatever, seven or eight that came out. Like, <laughs> yeah. sorry, 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 sorry. But wasn't I think that there were several endings of that movie, like one yeah. way one where one way was a tie, etc. And they they sort of did a survey what people preferred, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's not always about giving an audience doesn't always want what they explicitly say they want, yeah. right? And I think, I got I, every time I say this, I feel like rocks get thrown at me from the audience. Like you you can't trust players to tell you the thing they want to see in the game. Mm. Yeah. You can trust players to tell you their reaction to the game. And you can trust their reaction and you have to. If you don't, then you're, not, you're, you're no longer listening to them. But then they'll kind of, yeah. they'll reason out what, what their reaction came from and it's often irrelevant or erroneous. Either because they're, it's an unconscious thing that they're trying to make conscious and then it becomes nonsense in the making conscious or they're not game experts and they don't know how to make games. And if you ask them how to make a game, they're gonna give you an answer that doesn't make sense. It's like that's why there are people considered game experts is because they know how to make games. So I think there's a, the, the mistake is to like sort of hand it to the audience and then say like make it for me, right? Yeah, I mean oh. playtesting is as much about watching the person as yeah. about asking them questions. It's like, oh, do they, you know, they, they look like they're having fun and they, or their body language says they're having fun and then they say, well, I didn't like that. Look, well, you sure look like you liked it, you know? Um, <laughs> and, so, and so you kind of have to take everything that they say with a grain of salt and kind of, you know, both read the person and read what they so, say. So, so actually here's a, here's a, here's a thought. So perhaps like the idea of like we talked about indie games and perhaps like art, the art games movement. Right. Is, that, is that a movement that's tied to that moment in time where sort of video game development becomes so professionalized that the, that the designer has to sort of turn off their own taste for, for a period of time? Is, it, is there a reason why it occurs now? Is that because, because now it's more accepted that a video game developer has to make something that he or she doesn't necessarily like him or herself? And then you have this uh, suddenly the romantic idea of the romantic artist that doesn't care about the audience sort of comes in from sort of left side. Does this make sense? So, so you're saying in some sense that like... Uh, so, that, so, 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 that like say like say like 1985, people making home computer games. Mm -hmm. so, so there wasn't as perhaps like the, the, the reason to be an... There wasn't as, as much of a strong reason to create an, like an art games movement because people were just like fooling around and doing, doing weird stuff anyway. So, so it's more like perhaps like now the industry has become so large and so streamlined, then there's more of a room for that kind of position of the art game. Do, do, do you think that makes sense? Yeah. So you can sort of rebel yeah. against the evil big industry and, and say like, I'm just doing things on right. my own, I don't care about money, and I, I'm living sort of upstate and off the land, basically. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was actually, I was, in, uh, I was in Buenos Aires. I was in Buenos Aires last week at the AVA conference, and the guy who made uh, Today I Die, and, and I Wish Where the Moon was there, and unfortunately all the talks were in Spanish, and my Spanish, especially when it's, when it's Buenos Aires, Argentinian Spanish is terrible. But like, like the guy was up there giving a talk, and basically his talk was, quit your job, go out into the woods, like oh, okay. make the games you love, why do you, why do you enslave yourself? Um, and, and, the, and, the, and you know, there's enough of an industry there, like companies like QB9 and Three Melons are, are pretty big companies, they're like 40 people or, or 60 people, and they were bristling at this, right? Like you're telling all our employees to revolt on us, and anyway, <laughs> we, make, we make good product, and uh, yeah, I think there is a positioning that comes from that. I mean, I don't know if the desire for it from, from the artistic standpoint comes from it, but certainly the rhetoric around it. Um, and the positioning and culture comes from that, like, yeah, games are becoming normal, and so now people want to rebel against the normal and make yeah. weird, weird things, you know? So, so I, think, I think there are also just more channels available yeah. for people yeah. to do it <clears throat> that there weren't before. You know, even the, the major consoles have, you know, a place yeah. for smaller games, and there are sites specifically people can go to, so it seems easier to get this stuff out. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that that matters a lot, right? Yeah. So yeah, the scale. I mean, it also yeah. is just everything. Can be, things can be done on a smaller scale now. Yeah. You don't have to have, and the means for publishing are much wider. So yeah. you're going to get people um, expressing themselves. But, but yeah, but okay. So still, so it's funny that that, that suddenly people promote the idea that you're not making money as something positive. It's, it's <laughs> <laughs> so 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 let me sort of switch to something that's sort of always somewhat related. So so this is a, a quote from uh, from someone. This is a 
so I don't know if you read a blog like Kotaku. So everybody, everybody, <laughs> every time somebody just mentions the we or something, then yeah. there's like this huge flame war. <coughs> people are really angry and. And, and then, so, so this is one of those typical sort of kind of quote, like, if gaming is to be accepted as an art form, should the complexities be iron art so grandma can come first in Mario Kart? Yeah, and, and, and the example here really is like, what if the church has asked Michelangelo to pay the Sistine Chapel as a cartoon? So wouldn't, wouldn't that be blasphemy? So, so, so at least it's true if you read, so, so like empirically it's true that a lot of people sort of seem very upset, at least at, at some of these sort of developments. And then... In a way, that, so the question is, is, is that just, are they just sort of fools and they should get over it? Or, or is, there, is there sort of something else also going on that has like certain kinds of games, it's harder to make certain kinds of games or fund certain kinds of games? So, so you, can, you can say either, should they get over it or, or there's some truth to it? Or, or both. Get over it, yeah. I th <laughs> it's, it's like... <clears throat> you know, you have like that favorite band yeah. that nobody knows about, <laughs> yeah. and you're like, it's so awesome, you have to listen to this band, but part of it's being awesome is that nobody knows about it except you, but then when you hear it on the mainstream radio, you're like, ah, oh, they sold out, you know? Yeah. And it's just, it's not the same anymore. Yeah. Right, but this is like worse, it's like they're saying, they have a favorite pastime and no one yeah. else can know about it. It's yeah. like, you get right. like, mu like, I know about music. I don't really want to know about <laughs> yeah. it. <laughs> yeah, it's, you know, it's like, you know, mom getting to play the video games, and all of a sudden mom's hogging the console. Yeah. You know, and you have to, like, argue with mom for time to play. But I think there's also a fear that, um, you know, there's, there's a desire for complexity and difficulty and challenge in a, in a, in a hardcore audience, and I think there's a fear that that's going to go away. Mm. I think there's a fear that, like, like, I think people look at games like Bejeweled, and they, they, they worry that, like, people are going to stop making... Modern Warfare because they're going to pursue this, and they and it's not like the audience is stupid. They know the audience is bigger, yeah. so they're just scared that this whole thing is going to dwindle and die. And it's not like that hasn't happened, right? Like you know, like like the, you know, Chris Hecker has that famous comparison between movies and comic books and the mm -hmm. progression between movies and comic books, in which he argues. I just I'll summarize it very quickly that like if you look at the period in which comics were in their heyday, they were about an equivalent economy to movies. And so it wasn't clear at that moment whether movies or comic books were going to win. And movies have obviously destroyed comic books. Mm -hmm. And they are, the argument that, that Hecker makes is that it's because comic books stayed genrefied. They stayed stuck mm. in, a, in an adolescent ghetto where movies allowed themselves to expand. But then to a, to a comic book lover, that would be a horrifying thought that comic books would, would move away from the things they like because then less of the things they like would get made. I, I guess I, I, I want people to get over it. One, because the assumptions about difficulty in casual games, as you argue in the book, are ridiculous. Um, and the idea that these things aren't challenging is just, is just, is just, is just erroneous. It's an erroneous thought. Um, but I think, it, at, on the other hand, it's because the growth of the medium doesn't mean the, the disillusion of the genres they, they know. Mm. Um, and also, for a third reason, because if you look at the evolution of games, even these hardcore games that people think are hard, when compared to early arcade games, are actually quite easy. Right, like most yes. most games that are sold for the 360 now, like I, I have a lower difficulty curve than a game like Defender. Mm -hmm. You know, and I don't think gamers realize that because they've been sort of weaned, very carefully weaned to right. easier things that they enjoy more, which is just more of my proof that you should not automatically trust what your audience thinks about its content. Yeah, it always feels like, uh, you know, like when I teach them, you know, all my students, a lot of students like wind up being very. Um, like they're like usually like kind of they come to a class they take a class about gaming because they're gamers and and there's always this sort of uh, whenever the Wii comes up there's sort of this rejection of it it's like oh that thing's awful you know and it's like uh, and there's no good games on that and you know which is so and it runs so counter to the sort of the general. Um, public perception of the Wii, um, you know, and it feels, in the, in it almost like, yeah, like they're afraid that it's going to take away something of theirs, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I think Nintendo's strategy wasn't like, we're going to take away part of the gaming, you know, part of the gaming thing, we're just going to make the pie a lot bigger, right? Yeah. And so I think that, you know, when people get really upset about that, they're just not realizing that I think the pie has just gotten bigger, you know, mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's more of it out there, and, you know, I don't think Sony's in yeah. Dire straits of going out of business anytime mm -hmm. soon. So, so there's a specific example actually, which which, which sort of played into to Mia's way of framing it was that the, the, the harmonic says that when, when they made Rock Band two and mm -hmm. introduced the no fail mode, so so which is something you can turn on and off, just means you can, no matter how bad people are, if they never played the game, they will not stop the song yes. because they're not doing anything right. And then like they they actually said that they actually got criticism for that. So people were some people were angry, just that that option was present, right? And so, so that, that, that was clear, that's clearly plays into Mia's argument, right? That it's, I mean, people could just play it without turning it on, right? So right, what's, right. Why, what's yeah. the problem, right, right? right? And the problem is just that exactly that accessibility, like having put that energy into 
becoming an expert at this and then just seeing it become easy. Right, so right. People, it's, it's, just, yeah. it's a bit like people who are like really good at punctuation. I don't know. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. So, the style yeah, does. Really <laughs> no, it's part of, yeah. I mean, being a gamer, I'm, it, you know, for a long time it's has been really looked down on. And so to actually claim that as part of your identity, you know, means something to people. It means you might have been beaten up in school or ostracized mm. in some way. But, you know, it's, it's, then it becomes a part of you in a very visceral sense. And to see that maybe definition changing or like the, the audience, you know, mm. for who is a gamer changing is sort of threatening in the sense of, well, mm. I'm a gamer, you're not a gamer, mm. you know, it, it's, it's a line that we draw. And I mean, it's not just video games that people do this. I mean, any type of activity where there's, you know, people who are really dedicated and not, you know, it's like the whole debate about, well, are you a runner or a jogger? You know, it's like, oh, well, if you run slower than, you know, nine minutes a mile, you're just a jogger. You know, I'm a runner. And they shouldn't allow people in marathons yeah, if they yeah. take more than four right, hours right. to finish. And, I mean, there's, it, it's the way that we define ourselves in relation to other people. And with this broadening of the audience, there's sudden that crisis of, well, but who is a gamer now? Yeah, it's, it's interesting because I, 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 I think that's really key is the construction of the identity, right? Because yeah. the question that I would ask is that if, if, if everybody's gamer's mom started playing rock band on expert, <laughs> would anybody be crying about that? Would that be bad? And I think that's a, and, I, and the no fail thing seems to indicate to me no. That like, it, what, 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 I mean, because the whole gamer culture is built around an idea that I actually did this for four hours and now I can play Ninja Gaiden and get through that level without dying. And that was a really hard thing to do, if pointless. And <laughs> like now that I can do it, this is like an achievement I have. Yeah, it's even right. framed that way in games. It's like achievement. Like mm -hmm. I've, I've accomplished something. I'm at a level, a level of skill. These are all like game terms. I can't even talk about it without stumbling yeah, in game yeah. terms, <laughs> right? And I think that like that that there's there's a sort of expectation that like you got here because you were good. You got here because you were skilled. You got here because you met the demands that the system put on you and you, you fulfilled it. And it's that struggle that you see in games with bad design to not. Like even when they're bad design, people will try to figure them out because it's part of the, the achievement. And I, and I wonder if it's really just a, a, that's why I think it's more of a fear of that complexity going away than anything else because it's like, it's a no, the idea that you could play a game and not fail, that's really scary. And that's why, you know, look at the rejection of the new Prince of Persia, right? Like the wide scale proje rejection of Prince of Persia, which doesn't do anything different than any other Prince of Persia game than make it look like you can't die. Hmm. And this was like horrifying to people. Um, yeah. yeah, but they, it's just, so that's more like in, in the, in the kind of fiction, in the sense that there's just like this, that she swoops down and saves you every time you fall, and it's like they might as well just like restart. Yeah, no, yeah, it's true. So you 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 want to show that you can take it, basically. That that, that seems to be something like. That. Yeah, yeah or you want to be able to show off expertise. I mean, yeah. it's like why why people like people like seem to get offended by bejeweled sometimes in like this sort of untimed <laughs> mode, and it's like, you know, as if that like uh, because you can play this game without like. Expertise that somehow like a, a moral failing on the game's but, part or yeah, player's yeah, but, part. Yeah, but I think it's interesting because if you have an achievement which is like play through an expert mode within blah 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 x amount of time, and that's the only way to get the achievement. Just the fact that there's an easy easy mode doesn't sort of denigrate and remove that achievement. But it, but it seems like people are reacting as if it did. Mm. Yeah. People when with every MMO, you know, there's a level grind to go up, and over time, the companies will like reduce the XP that you need to get max level so that the more casual players can mm -hmm. advance. And when I played Final Fantasy Online, every time they did that, there was this huge backlash in the forums. People like literally would say, I want my money back, you know, for the time that I spent that's now just been taken away from me. Oh, yeah. You know, um, they've cheapened my experience. There's this real sense, you know, in games of, if you put in the time and the work, you will be rewarded. And I think it can be a reaction to the fact that life isn't fair. And in life, if you put in the effort, it doesn't always mean it's going to pay off. Mm. But with games, there's sort of been that, you know, like, if you really, you know, work hard at it, you will succeed. And it's more of a level playing field. And to change that playing field really, really bothers some right. people. You're taking away someone's marker of success yeah. or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we'll, 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 we'll be sort of like having 1.2 questions and then we'll slowly be opening it for, for, for sort of like for questions from the audience. So, so let me just sort of, uh, let's do the, the sort of, well, I, I talked about the, this a little, that, that at least sort of, at least from the, those of us who come from a more kind of sort of somewhat like humanities or artsy background where we sort of like the idea of like that we are, 
like doing an important analysis of uh, explication of an important piece of work, then th there's been a tendency to focus on these like bigger games, right? So we, we've been we've been writing about yeah like Final Fantasy VII and so, and we, we haven't been writing a lot about well. Well, people, it, it's actually been embarrassing to mention Tetris. It, it's, a, it's been this kind of standing joke, you weren't allowed to mention Tetris. And so, so is there a kind of conflict between that? So, so why, why, why is that? I'm trying, so I, I feel that, that even still it's like, so, so I'm so, so happy that, that Mia did, did work on, on casual games because it's just so, so rare for, for people to do that. So I don't know, I guess, as an academic Mia, do yeah. you think? Do you, do you, do you, do you like why? Why? Why are this focused on, on the, like the bigger games? Do you, do you, do you have I a think theory? you had that great statement about like those either downloadable games or casual games. They're like the video games of video games. Yeah. You know, yeah. that for most people in the wider world before this revolution, you know, video games were looked down on and is seen as sort of something to be ashamed of spending your time doing. And then within the space of game studies where it's okay to say you play games, blah, yeah. but, you know, you don't really mention Peggle, yeah, you know, yeah, 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 yeah. that you play. So there's still that, like, the, the ghettoization of, of one particular form. Yeah. Um, I think some of the early um, work really just kind of centered on a few games that people thought everybody had played, mm. and those were, you know, of necessity bigger things like Myst and Tomb Raider. It's like, you know, I'm, I don't think I need to see another analysis of certain games and like SimCity. Yeah. Um, but you know, like people felt like they needed to focus on some big ones that maybe had a broader reach. Um, but now, and, and I think it's also a function of we study what we like. Mm. Yeah. And so you know, a lot of game studies academics are people who really like big games and they're going to gravitate towards studying those at the expense of, you know, Mr. Case Files. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So do you think that, I mean, so I guess in theory it should be, depends, it should, of course it will depend a little on your, on your, sort, of, your sort of training, I guess. So, so I mean, in, in theory, so everybody coming from at least certain parts of cultural studies should just be into whatever people were actually playing Right, but, but it doesn't seem to be the case. There's still this kind of preference for, mm -hmm. for, for certain kinds of games, even when you're studying actual players. Right? There are. I mean, and st you can see this. There aren't a lot of good analyses of sports games. Mm -hmm. And they're huge. They're the, like, you know, one of the hugest genres, and we still don't have a lot of good studies of them. And you know, they can be fairly hardcore games. Yeah. So it is, I think, a lot of people <laughs> following their preference. You can see it in virtual world studies, all of the studies of WoW. <laughs> And Second Life, and you know, it's like, do other virtual worlds exist? <laughs> yes, they do. Um, I think it's a matter of like people. Some of it may be difficult, you know, like Club Penguin. Um, it's hard to say, you know, that my experience of it would be equivalent to the average age user of it. Um, but part of it is also just, I think, comfort zone and, and pushing beyond that, you know, to say what are what are the other types of games that people are playing, hmm. you know, and what is it that's obviously making it worthwhile to them to study, you know. So maybe it's a matter of game studies academics, you know, kind of putting our money where our mouth is, like we did with game developers, saying, well, you should develop games for different types of people. We should study games oh, yeah. for <laughs> different types of people than ourselves. But yeah, but I guess it's true. I guess it's tough to to study games that you don't actually like, right? <laughs> it, 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 it's, yeah. Well, the effects scholars do it. Yeah, that's true. That's true. But then they they they're watching someone else, right? right? They, they, yeah. They, they, yeah. So, um, I guess so. So so I guess taking an outside academic academia and a little broader. So, I mean, well, inside the game industry and everybody who sort of discusses games, there, there's a there's a we probably don't have a canon we agree on, but there's a, a hierarchy of, 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 of things. Did you ever feel that somebody looks down on you because you're playing sort of smaller games or Wii games or because you're developing or thinking about developing for, the, for that kind of audience or different audience? Yeah, I mean, I think when you're, yeah, there's definitely, uh, I mean, when you go to the you go to GDC and like uh, you're, you're from the casual thing, it's, you get that little side conference that's like starts before it and is all sort of, don't you're not allowed into the rest of the conference sometimes, <laughs> um, and so it definitely feels like that. Um, yeah, you're like yeah. Are you are you talk to your you know people are like oh you make video games and you're like yeah and they're like oh so like you know on the PlayStation you're like no for the PC downloadables and you know most people haven't heard of that you know or they, and then you tell them when you say oh Diner Dash I'm like oh, I played that um, so then there's kind of this growing respect one for it um, as it becomes more prevalent. 
Um, but but actually, so actually for you that was a question about Giorgio's uh, mm -hmm. fa fashion show. So so it's because like uh, it has the two things. Like one one is that mm -hmm. it's it's it doesn't seem to play very well into sort of stereotypical hardcore tastes, right? And and right. and you don't strike me as being part of the core audience, right? Of particularly it. fashion. <laughs> yeah. So Giorgio's fashion show is a, is is a game in which you're putting together sort of like sort of fa Fashionable yeah. combinations of clothes mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. yeah. and, and getting rated on them, like on the runway. Kind right, of it's like a paper dolling game. You yeah. pick out clothes. Yeah. Uh, um, so what? What about? So, you, so, so <laughs> both things. <laughs> right? So, 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 so do you ever? Like, did you ever? Be, do people ever sort of turn turn their nose up at you for having worked on JoJo's fashion show? Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think uh, I think there's like a, a little bit of. You know, I think it's a little bit of amusement usually, right? It's not like an outright like, oh my gosh, um, that's horrible. Um, but like, <laughs> oh really? Um, but then uh, you know, when when something you know, but it, you know, when something's popular, then people, if it you know, in the portals, you know, they have a they have a fairly large audience, and so when something's popular, then people begin to to adopt that. And I don't think anyone would scoff at at Diner Dash or something like that. Um, uh, and now, after, especially after it's you know, bred gazillions of clones and that sort of thing. Um, but I think uh, there is like a, a little bit of like you're making, you know. Sometimes I think people, so I think that when I kind of run into tr tricky things is like when it seems like uh, people think assumed you were stereotyping when you were making the game. Like, mm. oh, well, you made a game for women and you made a fashion game, and you know, it's like no, I wasn't trying to stereotype um, women and saying like, oh, fa they, they all want to play a fashion game and they want to dress up paper dolls or whatever. It was like no, this was like a genuine. This was genuinely my take on fashion. This is what I thought was interesting. About it, and, um, and so, and I, I didn't mean to stereotype people at all when I made it. So you kind of, and I think that's, and that's that's a matter of your intent. I think when you when you're doing it. Hmm. So in, so so let's uh, so actually so 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 I call this like the 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 future of casual games and or the future of video games and and so so I'll just sort of like. So I guess do we have a mic so we can start taking questions? So uh, let me just like start talking about about this. So, so I was at a, I was at this game design event, and and, and some people were like sort of there, there were a few people who were seriously worried that basically Facebook games and I don't know if you play Farmville. So at least on, on paper it has around sixty nine million players who, who play regularly. So, so it's a, it's 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 a really popular game, right? So. There, there are actually a few developers who are worried that this would sort of eventually like, kill off all other game forms, <laughs> and, and so so we can we can discuss whether that will actually actually happen. But but is that so so is that the future? So do do do, do you so, so do you believe that that perhaps say like say like downloadable casual games were a phase and console games were a phase and then eventually we just say. If we're playing 3D games, it will be just like streamed through the little window inside the Facebook thing, and, and so, so actually we'll end, actually end up having like this one platform, perhaps like called Facebook. Or do, you, do, you, do you imagine something like like that happening? That perhaps like the social the kind of social framework does eventually like trump out everything else? Uh, mm. No, mm. I I tend your farm sometimes, and you're never there, and you don't, you know. Get to your crops very much, Jesper. No, I'm I'm very <clears throat> bad with my yeah. crops. Um, <laughs> yeah. Bad game. Yeah. But, bad, bad game. I mean, I think that there are, are still there's still an audience for lots of single player games. Mm. You know, there are times when I really don't want to interact with other people. <laughs> yeah. Um, even in a, you know, kind of an, a sense like this of you know like you know, sort of the absent friends whose farms you have to visit. Um, I just want an experience that's sort of tailored to me, um, mm. and I don't think, I mean, with, even with the casual game players that you talked with, it seemed like for many of them it was, you know, a single player experience yeah. that they enjoyed quite a bit, so I don't, I think that this is, you know, kind of the big thing right now, but I think, like, you're right, it's sort of a crest, maybe, of the wave that there'll be something else next. Yeah, yeah. and there's a, there's a, I mean, okay, one, social games from two years ago, were a lot less complex than social games are right now. Hmm. So it seems to me that there's just this, the standard trend right. of interactive systems of increasing complexity is, is ongoing. It's been stifled because social games are so ridiculously clony because there's so much stupid money and bad design in it. Um, <laughs> it, it, it not actually, and, and, and uh, uh, you know, particularly of the, of the biggest companies doing it, although I think there's a lot of innovation on that space and the potential for innovation is so high and, and the idea that there's just like another mafia game on that site is just like, drives me up a wall, but 
Um, and, and now I just want to rant about the, 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 the unholy business practices of that space. But, um, <laughs> but I, that said, I mean, there is increasing complexification there, and I think there will be continued increasing complexification. I don't. I have not seen, and it's not very easily publicly available, like what the demographics and interests are of people on social gaming sites. Like it's just kind of not around in a public way the way it has been for other sites, other sources. And I'm not. I'm not absolutely convinced at all that that Facebook is seen as a gaming platform by even the game players on it. I think it's it's, it's a multi-purpose device that happens to have games on it. That doesn't make the games less popular. And I'm not going to knock the popularity of this game. It's obviously a huge industry. But I'm not convinced that if I took Farmville off of Facebook and I put it somewhere else and I removed it from Facebook that it would maintain its audience. And that to me is a pretty telling question. I'm not convinced that anybody playing Farmville stopped playing any other games they were playing as a result of playing Farmville. I think it exists side by side with a bunch of other genres. It's just gotten a lot of media attention because Zynga raised $180 million. Um, that's not a figurative, that's a literal number. They raised $180 million two days ago. Um, so, so I was wondering. Also so, scammed so, a lot of people. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> and, and, and there's like there's all sorts of issues around it. But I, the, like, it's, it's a direction that design is going in. It's a dream that you know, like I think game designers. I know that game designers in New York had for a long time. I mean, like, like we talked about it at, like years ago. The idea that like you'd have this micro community, and wouldn't that be so awesome that we'd have like this group of like our friends that we could play with, it'd be the return of the high score list in a meaningful way. And, and now that it actually happened, you don't like it. Well, yeah. nobody's, nobody's <laughs> using it, right? Like Parking Wars used it, and then, and then like the Playfish tried to use it in a couple games, and then it was just like, gone. And it was like, you know, like I mean, I, like having my friends run my restaurant is not my friends playing with me. And, and like it's cool that they do that, and I think there is some innovation in that space, but I think there's a, there's a, there's a ridiculously over-reliance over on uh, on, on, on conventions that have currently just come into existence like really less than three years ago and, and for an audience that we don't even know. Um, and I, I guess this is my kind of rant point for the last few <laughs> weeks, but I'll just say it. It's like, I think the most arrogant thing that's going on in the casual space right now is the idea that we understand the audience fully. It's an industry that's maybe 20 years old. Like movies don't understand their audience fully and they've been doing this for 100 years and they've been doing it with a lot more money and a lot more dedicated research than we have. The idea that we actually know what players on Facebook want right now is crazy to me. It's just crazy. We've barely experimented with it. Um, and the flood of money into that space in particular has made it un impossible to tell because if Zing is going to spend millions of dollars a month on marketing, it's kind of hard to judge what the audience wants in the, in the wash of cash that that creates. So, so I feel like, but MMOs still make money and they have growth. You can see the growth of MMO revenues over 2009. Um, casual game sites have been losing money, but it's not, a cle it's not clear that they've been losing money because of Facebook. There have been other movements that have gone on in the casual downloadable space, like the over-reliance on hidden object games. So I think, it's, it, I think we're in a, honestly, I think we're in a really weird bubble. And I think we're going to come out of this bubble, and it's going to make a lot more sense when we get to the end of it. But right now, there's just a lot of craziness and froth that has to settle a bit as this new genre gets figured out. So, so let's, uh, so if somebody wants to, uh, Let's start taking questions. Yeah. Sorry, I ranted. So yeah, that's a good rant. So yeah. All right. I, uh, I wanted to ask about um, interactive narrative and where you feel that um, sits with game studies. Like, do you feel as though um, interactive narrative is something that falls within video games? Like, video games have a possibility to create interactive narratives that you know other mediums can't just because of the nature of you know mm. the technology or whatever or do you feel as though interactive narrative is more of its own kind of thing that video games can you know dabble with but they're not necessarily mm. you know it's not necessarily within <clears throat> I don't know why I'm nervous it's not necessarily yeah. <laughs> within like uh, video games as in art form exactly okay okay so so uh, I guess that let's, let's, I guess I don't want to answer it in two ways. So, so one is that, that I think the problem with the idea of the term interactive narrative is that it, it also may, always makes me feel that there's this kind of tree and then you choose go to page 30, 37 or go to page 8. So, so, it, so it, it, it sound, always sounds a little static, but if, if you perhaps ask to what, to what extent can you yeah, well, make a... A kind of game in which there's an, an interesting fictional world in which you interact with. Let, let's, I guess it's the same thing, right? But um, I think what's happened recently is, is that I, I think people have started to see things that make sense specifically for games. So, I mean, to me, it was it sort of came through with the 
with ICO. So just the, the, just say like this thing that you can just affect, say that you follow a, another character, even if the character doesn't say something, and then you, you solve problems together. It's actually, for example, that's incredibly powerful. And, and, sort of, and that's something, something that's sort of really, I think, really u unique to, to video games. And, and people, even like the single player campaign of Modern Warfare 2 does it. So my nice company of, of fellow soldiers sort of takes care of me when I'm not exactly sure where to go and stuff. And that, that actually works very well. And, and Uncharted 2 does it, does it too. So I think that's, I think that's, it's, I mean, it's a question of time. People are just sort of figuring out that there are certain things that video games just do much better than, than other things. And it's just me say it in, and actually in relation to the whole question of casual games, I think that the weird thing is that, at least as I recall in like the 90s when people were talking about reaching a broader audience, one of the ideas was that if we just like finally make a good narrative, then we finally get that broader <laughs> audience. And then, and then yeah. what sort of seems to have happened is actually like the complete opposite, right? That, that all of the, the sort of really accessible, broadly popular games just have very, very little narrative. And, and it's a little hard, hard to explain why, but one possible explanation is the, is the idea that narrative implies a kind of ahead of time commitment, right? Mm -hmm. So you feel that you have to sort of play through and people aren't necessarily interested in that. So, so can, those, those are can, two. So if yeah. I can interrupt you a little bit yeah. and uh, clarify my question a little better. Oh, sure. Um, with respect to casual versus hardcore games and um, thinking about it in terms of stereotypes, I feel as uh, a former hard, recovering hardcore gamer <laughs> that uh, one of my stereotypes of casual games is that they were diversionary. Yeah. Whereas uh, a hardcore game would be like an experience, you know, like I'm going to, you know, sit down and mm. play Final Fantasy XII because I, you know, want to know what's going to happen in this story or whatever. And I'm going to sit down and play Grand Theft Auto because I want to have this experience. And mm. I feel as though um, when you were talking about Peggle and the reward you receive at the end of that and yeah. the constant positive feedback is similar to what a lot of hardcore gamers would experience with a lot of... Um, um, early 3D games where you'd play through a game and your reward would be a cutscene. Yeah. So I feel as though that's really what kind of got the uh, whole, I don't know, cinematic aspect of games going. Like, you know, you have this technology where you can have more interesting cutscenes. Yeah. So you play level, then they give you a better and better cutscene. But then, mm. you know, some games will innovate more. A game like Metal Gear Solid will try to make it a lot more cinematic. And I think that'll start raising up questions when people play games like, oh, you know, I don't like this character or the story yeah. is this and that. And I feel as though it's interesting where um, these cutscenes that before were just seen as like the reward for playing a level, and now it's such that the technology is so advanced that we can actually do so much more with this and create a game like Ico, or like Shadow of the Colossus, yeah. or like Heavy Rain that's coming out, where it's much more about this interactive narrative than necessarily a game mechanic. And mm. I'm just wondering if you feel as though that's where game, or if that's if there's still games at that point, or if it's just something else that you know video games can. Yeah. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so you, you want to. Well, I mean, there's, there's two different the there's two different desire sets, right? Mm -hmm. There's a, there's a narrative desire set, yeah. which I think is like a, an instinctive human brain activity, which is like there's an arc, it starts, it develops, it finishes, right? And like there's this drive that we have to get to the end of the story, which I think is an instinctive human drive. There's a, a different, a totally different drive, which is the struggle against challenge which is like the drive to achieve. Totally different, has nothing to do with the other. Like and games tend to fall more in that category. And, you, and there's a sort of natural idea that you can fold them together, right? Like, oh, we'll take the finishing the story desire and the getting an achievement desire and we'll put them together and they'll work. And the problem is they kind of don't work very well together sometimes because replaying something actually hate, narrative is horrible, horrible at replay. Um, but I think that, that what's happened, in, and, I, and I, I point to Eco as an example of this, like one of the most powerful things that happens in Eco is when you, when you, when you pull Yorda, there's a tug that's in the vibration of the controller, right? And so the, the interaction with Yorda is, is so deep that it, 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 it touches on the most core interaction you have with the controller. And I think that games have started <laughs> to figure that out. There is interactive narratives in the most interesting place it's ever been in my mind in human history because we have this flood of these little web games that are like really trying to explore what mechanics can do narratively, and it's everything from like, you know, like all these like I wish we were the moon kind of games I was talking about before to things like Closure to things like like Braid to things like um, I was just playing a game in the IGF called Spectres, which is like there's all this interactivity in it that's not really that it's not really accomplishment based, but it's really just designed to evoke a feeling, and I think that that's where. 
things are going to grow. We're finally at a point now with games where we see them as a medium and that, that interactive mechanics can be used mm -hmm. not just for achievement but for other purposes. And I think that's, that's, where, uh, that's where it's gotten very interesting. Okay, let's take the next question. Yeah. Um, I don't know. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> bid. <laughs> yeah. Bid for the right. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, my name is Kurt B. Um, the question that I had that I was kind of thinking about um, is while I was doing some research for a final project I was looking at, that a, a lot of the research finds that casual gamers lack loyalty, which is very different from hardcore gamers. Mm -hmm. um, and I've had this experience on a number of occasions where you'll talk to people who play casual games and they have this laundry list of evolution of games that they've played. And this, the time schedule for them, though, isn't like a hardcore game where it's like, oh, I played Assassin's Creed when it came out, you know, then I played this, and, and it's usually like a six month span. This is more like, oh, I, I used to play, you know, like Deli Stand, but that wasn't that good, and plus they make you do this. So now I play Hamburger Stand, but that was okay. So I played that for a little while, and now I'm onto this. And when you talk to them, they have this very like rapid response of, of games that they played. And I was wondering if you could explain maybe a little bit of what your thoughts are and why the, the loyalty to a franchise or even a game is so loose, where they almost feel like it's, you know, they take it, they pick it up, play it for a week, and then they drop it. Like, that's a common experience that I hear from a lot of casual gamers. It really depends on where you look, because um, there are a lot of the users, users of Big Fish Games, the portal, that are incredibly loyal and it's not necessarily the games themselves, although there's the whole mystery case files groupies. Um, but it's, if you read their, especially their forums, I mean, these are people who are, and I think this is actually a real difference between casual and hardcore. The casual people are, are so nice on these forums. It's almost disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> I have an RA working with me on a project, and he just like almost can't stand reading the forums, you know, because like, you know, they, uh, there's a casual MMO that they released, and somebody uh, started a code of niceness, um, you know, for players in the game. And, but there's like this real sense of, in Big Fish at least, of a, of a community around that portal and that publisher. Um, and then, especially like with Mystery Case Files, that series, there is a sense of um, loyalty to that series. Um, but beyond that, I'm not sure. I just know from that example, I, I did see some evidence of some loyalty there. And then there are the people who you know, don't post and don't interact. And there are legions of people who probably actually never buy any of these games. They download the free trials, and that's their game. They play it for 60 minutes, and when it's over, they don't buy it. They just download the next 60-minute trial and play it. And um, unfortunately, no one has really talked to them. Yeah. Have you talked with any of those players? No, no, but that, but also, so that's also like that, that's a self-selection, right? So, so yeah. obviously, when when you run those, like, please come and tell me about your 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 interest in downloadable casual playing games, or whatever. It's like, yeah, you you get the most dedicated ones. Yeah. yeah. So, but actually, so it's interesting. I, I asked Big Fish Games whether they didn't want to give me their data, basically. So, but so so I mean that, that's just the way it is. Right? Yeah. yeah. And I think with, I mean, I think there is a fair amount of loyalty within certain, fr I mean, there are a lot of franchises which have, you know, stuck around and people, you see, like, when you read the comments and, you know, when we, when we made, like, JoJo's, we would read all the comments and when the second one came out, people were excited about it and that was very gratifying. Um, the reason I think a lot of the games get played for a week is because the content in them lasts for about, like, five or six hours. Um, so in a week, you're done with it. And, um, and those portals also make it really easy they're really good at volume, and they're really good at mm. discovery. And, or yeah. there's like, oh, you know, everything's classified by time management. So if you like time management, you'll probably like this game, and you'll yeah. probably like Burger Dash and Deli Dash, and um, so. And Big Fish really cultivates it too. You know, like with Mystery Case Files, which is their own developed product um, line. I mean, they they release sneak preview trailers now, and they release bits of information months ahead of time. And they've with their latest game, they released a special collector's edition first, which was twenty dollars instead of the normal seven dollars. So, and you had to like wait another two weeks, you know, if you wanted the seven dollar version right. of one. And there were still people who like downloaded the nineteen ninety nine version like the minute it was released. Right. But they've been sort of almost like teaching these players in ways that like Nintendo Power taught players twenty years ago. You know, kind of here's what's coming and why you should be excited about it. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of cultivating some of that loyalty. Should we take the next question? 
So yeah, I, I, I didn't really. Uh, uh, yeah. My question comes from like um, a lot of the hardcore gamers are like those stereotypes developed from the fact that like for a long time, if you wanted to play video games, you had to have like a console or you had to have like some badass gaming PC that like the average person just would never have. And so now that, um, well, disclaimer, I'm involved in like a company that uses these sorts of engines, but these engines like Unity and, and Torque and stuff that are moving what it was typically in the realm of the hardcore onto the browser where I can just literally click mm. on the tab and play a game of that caliber. How do you think that's going to sort of disrupt this casual, you know, stereotype of the game that, you know, it's completely in 2D and completely mm. simple and all that sort of thing? Like real physics and all that. So... Okay, so, so my feeling is that, that 3D, like certain kinds of 3D is, is a, major ba a major barrier. And, and I think the major barrier for a lot of people is that feeling of having another body distinct from your physical body. So, so if you look at, let's say, like Wii Sports, uh, it's still, it's a 3D game, right? But there's like a sort of direct mapping between where you are and what's in the game. And the camera doesn't like move around like all the time. And I think that it seems that that's, that kind of 3D gives a lot of people a lot of problems. The moment that, say, like they're moving the, the joystick this direction and then the camera moves, so actually you have to like change the direction of the joystick and you have to imagine that character. And I, I think a lot of people have huge problems with that. So I think that sort of, that doesn't really work if you reach, want to reach a broad audience. But, but more if you have, like, have a kind of, say, like fixed camera and a kind of physics space, uh, I mean, it makes perfect sense. So I think it's more a question of, of figuring out how to make interesting games that are sort of easily accessible w w in 3D. And, and I think people have, have problems doing that. And, and part of it is that like the kind of whole bodily thing. So, so the, flat screen, the flat surface of the screen is there, and everybody understands what that is. But the moment you have to go into that sort of fictional space, a lot of people become, become very disoriented. So, so I, I guess I would say it's a, it's a sort of possibility, and, and I'm not sure if people have sort of exactly figured out how to sort of solve that problem. I don't know if any has, anybody has. Yeah, I, mean, I would agree with you about the 3D thing and just the, the level of complexity it adds in terms of, you know, just the, the controls and what you have to do. I think, um, I think it'll probably allow people who might play games on consoles to move in there, but I don't think it's going to necessarily eat the Farmville audience, you know. I don't think necessarily people are like, uh, you know. That that those are those are different players. So um, I think it'll you know the I think more eventually more stuff will be played in the browser and they'll get experiences more like they, what they were looking for in other places. You know, but they will just have a more general access to it, I suppose. But just to throw an example of Velociraptor from uh, Flashbang, mm. like I think they actually took the crazy visceral bouncing around and mm. capturing the dinosaur. They took an aspect of the 3D experience you're talking about, Jesper, and they made it really accessible mm. and they just skipped right to the fun part without the intense control navigation thing you're yeah. talking about. So it, so I was thinking about sports games, so it might actually partly be that mm. um, there are some opportunities there that yeah. are yet to be discovered. Yeah. yeah. I think that, that makes sense. Mm. So, so I think Charles had been, looked hungry for a while. Yeah, very hungry. Uh, no, uh, so, um, I guess my question would be, um, and I might, I might reveal myself to not have the best knowledge about casual games, but it seems to me in, in the games that all of you have all been talking about, um, the one thing that does seem to remain true, even though all of these other stereotypes about difficulty and previous knowledge might be exploded, um, is that there's very little direct competition between people. I mean, yeah. even, even a game like Farmville, which is multiplayer, you're not competing with other farms. You're allowed to help out on other people's farms. Is this, like, what do you guys, mm -hmm. w what are your opinions about competition, um, especially since even though we have hardcore single-player games, multiplayer games are still very much a staple. Um, is there room for a casual? Oh, there is. A competition room? Yeah, there's, um, there was a woman, she was a columnist from the New York Times, and she called me because um, she, she wanted to talk about cheating. She plays Scrabble online, and she cheats at it. <laughs> she has this pr other program open, like if you enter the letters that you have, it'll give you different word combinations. And basically, she wanted to feel better about what she was doing. <laughs> that's, 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 that's Scrabble, right? Like, and and we, we're OK with competition and board games. It's, it's a board game adaptation. Do you know mm -hmm. of a game that's sort of, I guess, original IP would be hmm. the, the phrase?
phrase toward that is about direct competition? So, so I think a lot of those things carry over, right? It, it's just that, and, and I guess we don't have a, a lot of theory about, about that. I mean, there's some sort of personality type stuff that some people like direct competition and some people dislike it. And I guess we haven't sort of discussed it very well. But so my feeling is that, that people who like competition in a board game or card game also like it in a digital game. Mm. And so it just like carries over. But there, there, there's, there's personality type things going on, obviously. Yeah, but, right. And, but, also, yeah. and also just if you're going to define Scrabble, I mean, it, it, in why are Scrabble or Jenga not a casual game? You know, it's like just I think casual game expands far outside of the domain of uh, video games, you know, and so clearly people play Jenga or you know Monopoly competitively. Well, let me give you I'll give you a totally like like traditional casual game box in which competition fit very well. Pogo, right? Pogo is was a tremendously and Sumay is a tremendously successful site despite the fact that EA seems to ignore it whenever it can. Um, and all the multiplayer on was that site was a high score list next to the game that you would play. Right? So people would play to get the highest score on that list. They didn't interact. Um, and that's typical of, of casual games uh, for a number of reasons that I think are not necessarily even related to players, but just the complexities. As someone who has a company that died based on real-time interactive, uh, interactive play online, I'll tell you there's a lot of hard things to do in real-time interactive play online that have nothing to do with audience. Um, but like, you'll see them, they'll fight for high scores in, in that space. So. All right, so the next question. And I don't really, re who feels that they have the right to be the next one? <laughs> Sorry, Eric Von Cole, and I was at Overrun Media, I was at a soccer MMO, Power Soccer, and re recently been studying a lot of the social space. And from a collaborative versus um, competitive standpoint, one of the things I found in studying them in different games, and out of Asia, a lot of developers have a mechanic in it, which is a stealing mechanic, where you go and steal from your different players. And I found, you know, Western audiences hate that. They read much more like the collaborative gameplay where there's not a stealing impact involved. And you can see the different audiences. I've talked to the you know Asian developers and they have a hard time coming into the Western markets because of that um, gameplay where you have a lot more of less collaborative play. And I think part of that too is just that, that Facebook has a much more female demographic. It skews more female. Um, and so does casual games. And I think you see from a more female demographic a little bit more of a collaborative in playing. Now, Zynga's played a lot off of that in the way that they've done trying to get players to come back in and, and you know, socially spam their other friends because it's all about, you know, I'm helping you and help your friends to do this. And I think they're really playing to that as a way to, to manage, you know, users' collaborative mm -hmm. play. But all of Playfish's games and most casual, most social games have a list of your friends on the on the sidebar and their scores, and you know you play to beat your friends, right? I mean, I think it's it's a combination of those things. It's not it's not one or the other. Um, you know, I think I think ultimately it, you know, there's, there, it, it, I, I think it goes back to your your point, Esper. It's just there's a complexity of motivation, and, and we see them mm -hmm. distinguished. And I'm sure there are cultural differences. I don't I don't doubt what you saw, but I also you know I, I think why is that an ubiquitous thing in social games to put the list of your friends' scores. Like, what purpose does that serve? It's it's so you can see where you rank among your friends. That's an inherently competitive desire. So I don't think it's one or the other. But then I think like what's special about social game, like fa say Facebook games specifically, is that there there are so many games you can always pick that game in which you think you might have a chance. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so, so I mean I think that, that that's pretty important, right? So that's what makes it very different from say like playing snooker with with someone. So my question is coming from a person who grew up as a hardcore gamer and now academ academia and everything else is I don't have the time. We're, uh, we're sorry, we apologize. <laughs> transitionary thing. But um, this kind of brings me to like have this attraction to like episodic content and the ability to play games like that I would consider serious and more complex but mm. do have a knowable end goal. Yeah. Um, and I was wondering what you thought about that as being a, a way to kind of bridge the like the CSI and the, the lawyer and you know law and order and the way to address like more serious games in a digestible time frame. I think that makes sense. I just think that there is still way too long. So 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 say like Half Life. What was the example? Half Life Two Episode Two, which is like. Episodic content, and it's still five hours, right? Uh, yeah. And the data they have from Valve is that less than 50% of the players have completed it. So it just seems to me that 
So I would like to see that down to say 30 minutes or something. Like what about like Monkey Island? Like yeah. I have, me and my friends yeah. always go after the next Monkey Island episode. Yeah. And yeah. you can beat that in about an hour. Well, that's been the success. The success yeah. stories have been known content, right? Yeah. I mean, th there's, there isn't a lot of original content in the episodic gameplay model that has been wildly successful. I mean, I kind of can't, what, what would be? Sam and Max isn't really original. Um, Penny Arcade isn't really original to the, to the content. I mean, I, can, I can't even think of it. An original episodic content that was raw episodic content from its initial stage that has... What about Pocket Guts? Okay, that, that's, that, yeah, potentially. I know that's not at all the narrative that I was referring to, right. but um, something in the middle. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, I, it's a really promising model, and maybe it's the point you raised, it's just the time involved, but there haven't been a lot of wildly successful episodic games, and, and, and it's something that people have been poking at for a while, but I don't think anybody's quite figured out how to make it work. No. Um, something you brought up earlier was, you know, you were showing up through PS1 through PS8, and the exponential growth of production, so mm -hmm. I'm guessing, like, I don't know um, a lot about development costs for capital, but my perception is that it's generally a lot cheaper than the AAA space. So what do you think, though, the future of casual games is? Because we're kind of introducing the whole rest of the world into games, not just the hardcore players. Are they going to start sort of demanding the same level of quality that regular gamers have started to demand over the years and just kind of end up in the same downward spiral? So, so essentially, there's two data points that would contradict each other, right? So one data point would be the downloadable casual game space, which just sort of it became more and more expensive to produce games. And because, because like the, yeah, well, I, I guess many other people in the audience can talk about this more and here can talk more about it than I do, but suddenly it became more and more expensive because, say, polish became a, a sort of big parameter. On the other hand, actually, so, so say if I take somebody who's not really into video games or, or technology and, and show them, say, say Wii Sports still, they, they will say it looks great. It's like, wow, wow, it really looks great, wow. And then I, I, and I read this, I, read the, I, have, I read this uh, sort of traditional gamer press review of Wii Sports where they were like offended by the graphics. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the big complaints was the characters don't even have any arms. So that's Yeah, beauty, not beauty, arms. Yeah, yeah so, uh, so, so then I think that, that, so what you get is also the question of style in, in, in the way. So, so it's clear that a lot of those like, yeah, Wii Sports is, is a fairly economical way of doing something, but this just uh, has a lot of, of style that, that people relate to. Well, so that seems to go the other, say the other thing that you can actually sort of keep the budgets at a reasonable level. But yeah, I mean, it seems like you're always going to, I mean, I think uh, you, you, you kind of point to an interesting thing and you, and you kind of mention it uh, when you're the sort of gamer profile of the casual gamer, that no one's, people don't generally stay casual gamers forever, you know, like once people start playing a lot, they, they kind of move to be, um, to, to play in more hardcore ways and, and demand more of the game. So, I, I mean, I think it probably will. Like, I mean, even like with the iPhone now, like uh, you see a lot of really cr crappy games that look like they took about like a day and a half to make, but like more and more of it, it's beginning to look more and more polished, like like Mini Gore or whatever. I mean, it looks looks fantastic, you know, and it looks like it took a, it took a while to make. And so I think you'll, in the more, the more people play, the more they kind of get used to that. And you, it, things will, you know, they tend towards, like games tend towards more and more intense and hardcore play, I think. And, and that's the same for casual mm -hmm. games, I think. What about like the model? Because, I mean, like with Big Fish, I mean, their, their price is $7 for a game versus like, you know, a 360 game, which is $60 or more now. And it seems like, and it went with the iPhone, like what is the average cost of a game? Is it 99 cents? Or yeah. yeah. I mean, is that sustainable for you? No. <laughs> I mean, but a lot of this doesn't go on in America anymore. It goes on yeah. in Ukraine, goes on yeah. in Argentina, goes on in China, right? It goes on places where, where the budgets are lower because the, the staff costs are lower. And um, that will stop because they're inflating. Like, mm -hmm. Buenos Aires is, is inflating its cost because they're starting to realize what they're worth. Um, yeah, but I think it, it's not like we're the first genre to go through this. Like, movies went through this. They were think, you know, movies blew up for a little while and then got too expensive and had to shrink back down mm -hmm. and sort of blew up again. Yeah. And I think, I think there'll be sort of natural movement there. I mean, that, that graph is just so clearly unsustainable that I can't yeah, imagine. Yeah, but the funny thing, it's been fairly consistent for at least like 25 years. That's right? true. Yeah, yeah. So, maybe, so maybe they will cost a billion dollars. Yeah, no, but, but, <laughs> but, but I mean, supposedly, it's like GTA 4 was supposedly $100 million. So that's the, the thing that's been thrown around. So. 
but but okay. So I guess we should probably take another question and then sort of wrap up. That guy back there. Yeah. Throw it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just whip it. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Um, I just wanted to return to the, the question of challenge again, and if I could maybe use the example you were discussing of, of Rock Band uh, you know, with the, the no fail mode. Yeah. And um, just wondering, you know, at, at what point does a mode like that become karaoke? Or, you know, the, the, what you're, or, or something you're doing with your fingers, you know, that, it, that it's more like square dancing <laughs> or knitting. And, 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 and could be jeweled be seen in a similar way. I'm, I'm just wondering, not to dwell too much on the question of definitions and where lines are drawn, but and setting aside the issue of, you know, um, identity and, and hardcore gamer paranoia of, of, of their space being taken over, um, I, I just wanted to hear your opinions and, and wonder about what you thought was the role of game studies to ask those questions. Is there a point at which it's not useful to call a piece of interactive entertainment that um, might be challenge-free uh, a game anymore, you know, and, 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 and wh where do you think that you all are in sort of exploring that space, drawing those lines if you find it necessary, et cetera? So I guess like sort of uh, the, in terms of like the definitions I've been writing about games and certainly something that is challenge-free wouldn't co constitute a game, right, because you need that like sort of variable outcomes and, and at least some player effort into moving the game towards the desirable well, I mean, outcome, right? Knitting so obviously has a challenge to it. Square dancing has challenge, right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and you have to do it correctly. Um, yeah. No, it's interesting to say, like, yeah, so, fa so Farmville, from that perspective, could be, a, be, could be like almost a non-game. I, I would include it, right? But also, I think the category of games seems to be sort of expanding a little. So people, so, so traditionally, Sims probably wasn't a game, and now everybody thinks it's a game. So, so I think it's just like sort of, Mm. Expanding a little the whole character. So, I mean, I think from a from a you know game development perspective, I think like and Bejeweled does have a challenge. And it's still a game, even if it, even if you can't lose at Bejeweled, mm. like in the untimed mode, you you know you could mm. sit there for you know three weeks or whatever. Um, there's still a goal in it. You know, you're you're still directed to score more points and that sort of thing. Um, I think uh, some of the with with casual games or or with Rock Band, you know, if there's a there's a, a mode where or where you can't lose. Um, you can still score more points. You know, the, your goal, you're still directed at something that you're trying to do. Um, and so I think that kind of, that allows people to kind of, um, I, think what, I think what's sort of important in casual games and, you know, or what winds up, uh, what, where developers sometimes fall in the traps is like you kind of let players scale that control entirely. Like, so, you, oh, you can't fail this level. Um, and I remember when we made um, casual games, it was always like this weird balance. You're like, we don't want anyone to fail, so instead we'll put in a star system. So, you know, they have to get three stars, they pass the level, which is basically impossible to not get three stars. And then if you play really well, you get five, you know, and so there's something you can strive for, but really we're not going to slap you on the wrist too hard. And mostly that's just because you're trying to consider how they want to play the game, and, you know, they, you know we don't want to stop people from moving through content and that sort of thing. Yeah, and just to be specific, the challenge in Bejeweled is finding the gems. Like, it's always a challenge to find the gems in Bejeweled, right? Just like in a, in, in, you know, in a hidden object game, they'll give you ten minutes to solve a level. That's a long time. Like, it's really, and then, like, seven hints for eight objects. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's really hard not to get through that level if you just decide you want to get through that level. But, but it's not trivial to find the objects, even if you can't fail at finding the objects. And I think mm -hmm. that's different than knitting or different than square dancing, right? Like, like, knitting is about the application of a mechanical, physical activity that you've mastered, and it's hard at first, but at a certain point, it becomes knitting because it becomes unconscious at a certain level. And dancing is certainly like that. I mean, dancing is absolutely like that. Um, as a swing dancer, I can tell you for a fact that, like, you, you get to a point where you, there's, some, there's some skill involved, but it's not a challenge. That's not what you're doing. You're not, like, your goal is not, like, there's a bar that I'm constantly trying to, to, to reach over when you dance. But you can be a knitter like that. You, you can, can be a knitter like that. Weird, oh, yeah. Strange, okay, sure. Now I'm going to do, like, two, three mm. colors. Now I'm going to. Yeah, like, but it's probably, there's a very few knitters that just make a square after square after square. No, like some people yeah, yeah. make the same sweater for their kids, oh. but other people start making weirder and weirder, yeah. right. weirder and harder okay. things. But, but the, 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 yeah, the distinction, anything. but the distinction of making, turning something into a game and having something be a game, I think yeah. is an important distinction yeah. there. Like, I can dance in a way that really, really challenges me, too, but that, like, I, I guess the point is that, that that challenge is always a piece of what I understand to be a game experience, even if I can't fail. Failure and challenge are not, this is just your point, right. in a different way. They're not the same thing. They're totally different things. And I can be very challenged in a system that I cannot fail in, and then it, it still kind of yeah. informs the game experience. Yeah. All right, so... 
So, okay, l l I guess I say, Mia quickly. gets the last word. The last, yay. Yeah. Um, I don't think necessarily that people will always privilege the challenge, though, you know, because especially with, like, iPhone games, you know, I play them on the T on the way to work. It's for distraction. It's to avoid people talking to me and, you know, or just to pass the time. I'm not necessarily looking to beat the level. I'm looking mm. to kill some time. And, you know, early game studies were focused on fun and yeah. enjoyment and immersion. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, there are lots of other reasons that people play games yeah. that we're only starting to investigate. All right, so uh, thanks everybody for coming and thanks to the, to the esteemed panelists. So thanks, it's been very good. And there's, uh, there's some copies of the book over in the corner if you're, if you're interested. And uh, thanks everybody and uh, play safe. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>